Well, that's the reason I wanted to have Rich on. Well, shit. I, I need to write. I need to write an article about or a book about this one, man. You should. The one that's that's better than the M9 bayonet. Oh, Which one is the, that? The, the Marine Corps one. Oh, the this, Marine Corps one. Yeah, this is the new. This is the OKC. 3S. 3S. Yeah. Yep. I agree with that. No, I, I've got Marco. I can't wait to play show and tell with you on on air, man. We, we, I've got the, all the stuff right here. It's gonna be fun. Okay. Are we gonna have a battle of the the bayonets? With you guys? I don't yeah. think it's gonna be a battle. It's more of like a wow. Would you get that? That type, type <laughs> on my part. That is. <laughs> I mean, all my shit is just you can buy it in Walmart. No, I'm I'm sure that that, that uh, you're gonna. I'm gonna. Flash one up, and you're gonna be like, "Oh yeah, I know exactly where that's from and what that's all about." All right, I'm just gonna show you one, and I see see if you guys can guess what that is. How about that? All right. All right. So, the it, light doesn't work. It's like this one. It's a Type Two with no hole. Is it a Type Two? All right, you all give up, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Let's hear it. Uh, it's a Mark III Navy fighting knife. Oh, with, yeah. Uh, yeah. I should have got that. With a weird blade. Look at the blade. Yeah, that that was, that's Cold War era shit right there. And uh, compared to the standard one, which is more of a like, what yeah. do you yeah. have now? Right? Oh, yeah. I remember those. Back in the day. So, Marco, you you want to save it for the show, or do you want to you want you want to? We should well, save. Well, I it for mean, the we'll show. go back to well, yeah, yeah. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Well, show me your. Well, I showed you mine. Show me yours. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> it's a type two, right? No hole. But it's a Chinese, right? Well, there's no manufacturers markings on this whatsoever there's no numbers there's no letters there's no anything it's china yeah oh like so, they say china you yeah know? so it's it's got a it's got the polymer mm -hmm. polymer thing but no wire cutter no hole I was kind of hoping if somebody would bring some like this because I mean I I've, I've seen them they were in uh uh bright uh, brown color too, mm -hmm. and if you remember, uh, well, I don't know if you remember that those um, so-called Chinese SVDs came in in that like case with all kinds of accessories in it, yeah, and that thing was in it. And um, but it, I was kind of hoping that somebody would bring because I definitely was going to talk about that. Yeah, and I, I've got the the old. Oh, school. and then another one. Yes, there you go. With the um, rubber grip, yeah. and then the yeah, I have that. The, but the bake light, yeah. What else you got? Oh, I, and then I got the GI Joe stuff. This one here, I've had this since I was eighteen years old. Okay, wow. hold on, hold on. Is that the M seven or which yep. one? M five. The M seven with the M eight aluminum bayonet or uh, holster scabbard. See, I got that. M7 with the M10 plastic. The plastic M10 one, yeah. Yeah, this one, like I said, I got, I've had this I've had this knife longer than any knife that I currently possess because I got it when I was 18. I don't know where the, the green shoelace went. It, it got lost. I used to have the green shoelace on here, though. Yeah. I did. Probably the leg tie. All right, let's, let's kick it, brother. Look, Paul, let's, we're starting on time. Are you happy? I am happy. I'm happy. And I'm here finally, right? I'm tight. I got I got grandkids inbound, so. Uh-oh. Uh, Little Ruthie coming? Yeah. Let's see if I she can misses do something me. better here. Ruthie misses me. I'm sure she does. You put it up a little higher there? Yeah, that'll work. Working on Marco's lighting in his studio there. 
Yeah. Uh, makeup. <laughs> <laughs> There's no amount that could help you. <laughs> no. <laughs> I broke so many cameras <laughs> by just sitting there. All right, AK Heads, welcome back to this October's edition of the Talking Lead AK Corner. And as promised, we're going to be talking bayonets this episode, ladies and gentlemen. Blades, pointy, sticky, stabby things. And I think everybody brought one, didn't you? Everybody got oh, yeah. Your, your bang, hold them up. Hold them up for our viewing audience there. So. Well, which one? Just whichever one's close. <laughs> Look at Marco. <laughs> so, that nice, nice. Look at that. So this is a uh, hug your hug your AK month, also, Paul. Oh yeah, this is hug your AK month. October eighteenth is National Hug Your AK Day. Very nice. <laughs> So as you guys are hearing this, you'll so have a couple coming of days up. to prepare for that. And uh, go on Instagrams and your social meds and take a picture of yourself hugging your AK and and hashtag it. What is it? H- hug hug your, your AK. Hug your AK. Just hug your AK. There you go. And then we should start a hug your bayonet day, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. We started With that and everyone's like... Scabbard on it. Well... Well, can I do the the? I don't have an AK. Do it, my my AR or my Garand or like it's hug your AK day. I don't want to hear any crap. And and this is the this is the twelfth one we've done. Twelve. This is the twelfth annual. Twelve. So years. people have had time to get AK. So I don't. You know, it's like there's no excuse. I mean, they could have saved. No excuse. Could have saved you know five hundred dollars a year, and they would have plenty to buy one now. Yeah. No excuses. And I get it. Yeah, no excuses. No excuses. So as you guys are listening to this, make sure you go back to our previous episode, which we had the great Jim Shockey join us. And uh, he talks about his new book. You got it over here. It's called Call Me Hunter that uh, he released. We talk about his amazing hunting and conservation career. And he's got a museum up there in, uh, in Canada museum it's pretty cool so we talk about that uh and a lot of other things so make sure you go back check that episode out i know you're going to enjoy it but this episode i got nothing but authors on the episode uh joining me is our consummate season five co-host ladies and gentlemen you love him you know him you wish you had a beard like him marco vorbis <laughs> hey nice to be here again Everybody hold up your books. Hold your books. Hold Everybody up. hold up the Bible. Hold it up. We got it right this, here. <laughs> yeah. This is the this is the this is the AK Corner official manual. The official manual for the AK Corner right here. And you do me you do me much honor, I have to say. Well you do us all an honor by sharing your wealth of knowledge each and every month, Marco. So thank you for joining us again. Appreciate it. I'm glad to be here. And this was kind of your idea, wasn't it, to do this episode on bayonets? Yeah. You're in I mean, it, because remember, we touched on the subject of um, how everybody is stealing from each other type of deal, like adversaries. They see, they find something in the battlefield and say, oh, sh- shoot, we should do this. And the uh, AK bayonet, and I guess AR bayonets, a good example of that. Yeah, absolutely. That was last month we've talked about that. Yeah. 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 And then, of course, talking about bayonets, you cannot go into, I mean, you cannot fully uh, kind of expand the the subject matter without talking where it came from, what the philosophy behind it was, and so on and so on. Absolutely. And we're going to get into that. We're going to talk about all that. Uh, also, uh, join us, who's only missed a couple episodes this month, is uh, our good friend, and my fellow podcaster, ladies and gentlemen, the pimp hand of America, Paul Mark. <laughs> That's right. That's right. No, I was. I'm. Uh, I was, I'm very happy to be here. And oh, wait, and I, did did Nick Orr have his new book out last month? Um, I don't think he had it during the episode, so it came out right after. Uh, oh, it was, it was a teaser. Yeah. So Nick's new book is. Uh, 
This is cool. the the Pipe Hitter's Guide uh, to Long Range Rifles and Sniping. Very so, nice. This is the fifth the fifth Pipe Hitter's Guide is out. And we're still threatening to do an episode, uh, maybe not we, with we, Nick, we, but about Nick. We need to do a book review. We need to get some people who have read the books, read and, the books. and do a review. You've read them. I've read them. Who else in our, you know, well, read Marco's my, read the, Marco's you read, read the, the, the small AK arms one. I'm sure there's right. a few of our listeners. Um, a lot of our listeners probably have read them also. So maybe we can get a listener perspective. Well, I will definitely read the new one too. Yeah. There you go. Now, kind of in my, in my realm. Now, Paul, do you have a new book out too? I have one that's in the process. In the process, that's what it's it it's being edited right now. Okay. So I, I don't want to say what it is, but it's being edited right now, and definitely by next month it'll be done. Very cool. So we can talk about that next month. Yeah, I passed it off to the smart people so they can <laughs> find all the mistakes. Yeah. I see you didn't send me one, so that, that says a lot about me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Also joining us for the first time on the AK Corner, this is not his first time on the podcast, but uh, first time on the AK Corner is our good friend from the Buck Knives world, ladies and gentlemen, Richard, call him Rich, Nyman, ladies and gentlemen, and you've seen me talk about this book before. I don't have the Bayonet book, so hold up the Bayonet book, so... Rich has has written the definitive book on the M9 bayonet. So it's just as thick and as good as he did on the Buckmaster uh, knife. So welcome in, Rich. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm definitely outclassed with these two gentlemen. No, (laughs) no, I'm I'm a low. I'm low. I've I've I've, I've, I've listened to both of you with uh, left hand. You guys are amazing, so I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Well, we appreciate you taking the time to be on. Definitely. I'm glad to make you acquaintance, Rich. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, and and then, I'm kind of hoping that because I was preparing for this episode, and obviously I was going to highlight the M9 and talk about it, but I would definitely would love to hear what you have to say. Thank you. So I'm getting... I'm getting my next piece that we're going to talk about here. So uh, in an upcoming episode, just to go ahead and and spoiler alert here, um, you guys, again, have have heard us talk about this, and we heard us talk about the new one that's been in development with Rich and Commander Coulter and CJ of the new Buckmaster. Well, it is out, and I've talked about it briefly, but we're going to do a full show Mm. with with Rich and Commander and, and CJ coming up. Uh, like CJ, CJ? CJ Buck, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, no, CJ Johnson. Oh, no, no. no. Why oh, different would he, CJ. Why would CJ know anything <laughs> about this? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, something to look forward to, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, it's we probably have to do like a two-part episode on that one. It's going to be a good one. We've got a lot of inf- information to disseminate, don't we, Rich? Yes, sir. Yep. A lot of history. A lot of history. A lot of history. Hey, Leadheads. White Settle with Seal One. Just here to talk to you and tell you a little bit about our product. Seal One CLP Plus is a bio-based, non-toxic product. It comes in a paste, liquid, aerosol, and pre-saturated bore-specific patches called Seal Skins. They all do the same thing, just different methods of application. The best way to use our product is to start with a clean firearm. There's two reasons why I say that. First, you start with the Seal 1 CLP Plus by field stripping your firearm and covering the entire firearm inside and out, bore, barrel, everything with the Seal 1 CLP Plus. You'll see how easy it spreads around. You'll want to wait about 15 to 20 minutes. Then you come back and you want to wipe it all off. So you see how easy it is to put on and remove. And the second reason we say to use a clean firearm is you'll find that it's not clean. We're gonna pull out more carbon that's been left behind with whatever product you've been using before. Okay, it takes about three cleanings. So I like to say a clean shoot, clean shoot, clean shoot, just normal usage before the Seal One CLP Plus has removed whatever product that you were using before and has seasoned the firearm. It's kind of like breaking in a cast iron skillet. 
and after that first cleaning you will notice a difference and with each successive cleaning you will find that it gets easier and easier to clean. Seal One CLP Plus is a dry lubricant and is designed to work as such. You will find that malfunctions are virtually eliminated when used properly because the majority of all malfunctions are caused to carbon buildup and with the Seal One CLP Plus the carbon does not build up. Seal One CLP Plus is safe on all metals, plastics, composites, polymers, rubber, wood, and leather. Seal One CLP Plus is a one and done formulation. No other products are required or needed to clean and lubricate and protect your firearm. That's why we say Seal One and Done. Seal One is a proud sponsor of the Talking Lead Podcast and the Leadhead Brigade. Use the code LEADHEAD for a 25% off discount. So let's get into this episode. Speaking of a lot of history, so the bayonet, it goes back to close to what, the, the 14th century, Marco? No, no, not that, co- not quiet. Yeah. Uh, it goes to 1500s, or so 16th century, when the uh, uh, appearance of uh, firearms on the battlefield becoming prominent and prevalent. Yeah, and they I had mean, similar things, I, but they weren't they weren't gun. They weren't on guns. So the bayonet is specifically no, attached no, to what, a gun. So yeah, what happens was so those early uh, fusils and muskets and stuff it was um, very. It takes a long after you fired the initial valley. It took a long time for for the um, reload the rifle. Oh, I mean the firearms to be reloaded. Yeah, and um, they were protected while they were doing it. They were protected by pikers, right? So it's sort of like a short spear that uh, low-grade soldiers would be then step forward and keeping the enemy at bay, so to speak, with the pikes. And then uh, while the uh, the fusiliers are reloading their big old massive. Uh, um, Fusils, I guess, uh, the best way to describe them, guns. Muskets. And I don't know if you can even call them a musket at the time. I mean, it's well, they, I think similar. They call them fus- it's similar fusils. so for our listeners so, to get a, an idea of what we're talking about here. And I could put right. one up but as you're talking about it, but go ahead. So uh, then uh, as more and more firearms kind of um, appeared on the, on the battlefield, the you know, it was an idea to attach a, a sword because most of the soldiers at the time, or foot soldiers, were equipped with the short swords. And that's how they came to be, and mainly to defend themselves against and, and uh, uh, arrange the foot soldiers into a square, anti cavalry squares uh, called carré. So this way they could they can protect themselves from uh, from the cavalry charges. So and as we progress, the use of bayonet or a sword on the uh, on the uh, uh, firearm became more and more prevalent and uh, more of a um, main battlefield weapon. Believe it or not, because you're firing one or two valleys and then you charge and when you charge you, you, it's not like you have a machine gun in your hand or any kind of semi-automatic gun or even a bolt gun or repeating rifle right so th- then it comes to uh it comes to uh to use of a bayonet as a matter of fact uh in the 18th century a famous russian uh general who never lost a battle and who pretty much uh, with a couple divisions liberated the entire southern uh, Europe and stuff and helped them to build nations, including uh, Northern Italy, was Alexander Suvorov. And he's written, uh, he's written a book called uh, um, uh, Science of Science to Win or Science of Victory. Uh-huh. And as a matter of fact... Uh, In which country is gen- he from? From Russia. From Russia, okay. And he was, uh, as a matter of fact, General Patton even quoted him every now and then. And uh, he is the guy who coined a phrase saying, uh, bullet is a fool, but bayonet is great. 
and right in the onset of uh, Napoleonic Wars, where bayonets were prevalent weapon. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, the, the artillery, of course, the quick cavalry charges, but as far as the foot soldiers concerned, infantry, the bayonets were uh, a main weapon. Yeah. And you could you could read in some of the um, recollections of some of the soldiers and stuff, and they would always refer to um, gleaming, you know, the bayonets were gleaming, and that's what gave the enemy the scare and stuff, or like our charge with the bayonets is what turned the battle around and so on and so on. Yeah, and you read that in, in some of the, the history is like the, the bayonet itself wasn't used a whole lot itself to inflict damage or wound but it was more of a morale uh, depleter you know kind of thing so when a when a big army would charge with their bayonets typically the other side would just retreat yeah i mean even even today if you if somebody is facing somebody with a knife i mean there's a reason why <laughs> let's say so many um incidents where a police actually shooting a guy who's wielding a knife the knife is uh is something I understand you know the you were around knives all the time ever since you little baby and you know if you touch it wrong you will cut yourself and it would hurt and it would bleed and stuff and uh that effect uh was uh, obviously if you have a wall of people coming at you with the knives and stuff that's different because in the right. early days especially when uh those muskets were not a really uh a, what you call a precision weapon they were um you know, I mean, you would stand there in the line and maybe a one or two guys after a valley, an enemy valley would fall down and you would know what happened there. But when the wall of people advancing at you with the uh, bayonets gleaming, that's a different story. Yeah. So shock um, and awe. Yeah, shock and awe. Yeah, original one. Yeah. So and that's how the bayonets kind of came to be. And today, although they still issued to the troops, but, um, you know, I mean, you know, with sidearm at your side or fighting knives at your side and stuff. And even, even if the enemy gets close uh, to the point where it's a hand-to-hand -hand combat, I mean, you don't, you, you probably will not be going bayonet on bayonet anymore, especially like the, the shorter weapons, like, you know, M4 and even not AK and, some of those, um, um, what do you call them? Bull pops, even worse. <laughs> you know what I mean? Hey, I got, I got a favorite. Fa my favorite one, Marco. Remember in the in the mid Cold War when everybody was coming out with submachine guns, right? The Uzis and the and they were they were equipping them all with bayonets. <laughs> yeah. The most ridiculous thing in uh, putting a bayonet on a submachine gun. What the hell? S somebody. Yeah, and the, and the Uzi, right? What are you going to do? Yeah. Somebody years ago uh, did did it as a gig, but it was it turned out to be a popular thing. The pistol. Thing. I, the pistol bayonet. Yeah, 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 pistol bayonets. I think it was a laser light or somebody. Did yeah. them and promote them. That was hilarious. <laughs> they would come to like our round tables. Well, and I've pass seen them around the uh, bayonets on the pistol musk, you know, the musket pistols, whatever they were called. I've seen bayonets on those. Oh yeah, the one oh, yeah, that they, unfold. Yeah, yeah. They they had the brass wall. knuckle handle, and they had a, a folding bayonet. Yeah, but that's that's not military. It's more like a, if you got caught cheating at the poker game, you had yeah. to defend yourself. Or pirates when they would, you know, raid ships and stuff. Yeah, or something Let, like that. But in any case, as a military weapon, I mean, uh, it lost its appeal, and I guess. Uh, can can I can I offer a modern perspective? The from the bay the bayonet is is still uh, it's funny that you said that Marco because we just had Sonny Pazikas on yesterday on our show and he he used that quote he said the bullet is a fool and the bayonet is a soldier and, and that was it was amazing that two days in a row I had somebody no, say that famous to me. quote you can. You know, like Pat, uh, uh, Patton, uh, Gen uh, uh, General Patton, he used to use this phrase saying, um, uh, you bleed less. Uh, if you sweat more, you bleed less. Right. He was paraphrasing uh, Savorov, who was saying, 
hard in training, easy in combat, you know, type of deal. So the, the guy, you can pick him sort of like Sin Tzu with the art of war. You can pick him in quotes, so to speak, right? And uh, mm-hmm. and uh, it's the same with Suwarov. And I mean, he took fortresses that were deemed to be untakeable, like Ismail, for example. He took it in less than a month. And, uh, you know, he crossed the freaking Alps with artillery and cavalry to get into Austrian's rear. Uh, he did all kinds of stuff. Uh, and he did it with the small force. That's another one. I mean, he knew how to apply a small force. He also developed the technique moving at night, quiet marches and stuff, and then appear there in the battlefield unexpected in the morning type of deal. You know, he was, he was a freaking genius. And he would not take crap from uh, from the czars, you know, from Russian czars and stuff. He would be, he, you know, he would pretend he would have a diary if, the, if uh, like Paul, for example, the Catherine's uh, son uh, was saying some nonsense. He would just say, oh, I'm so sorry. I got to go. I, I got a terrible stomach ache. He would even fall down and crawl out in the palace. <laughs> you know, he was that kind of good. And of course, he would catch a lot of crap. Like, um, you know, they would send, the, like, you know how they would uh, remove you from the court. So you're not you're not welcome in the, in the Get capital city or whatever. Yeah. And he goes, I don't care. And he goes back. And what he did was, since he was a count. What he did was he uh, every time his soldiers that served with him in campaigns would retire, he would place he would have a home for them to and his estate like do whatever like be the uh, groom or something for the horses or be this and that and that. So he took care of the retirees that been uh, with him through thick and thin, and um, you know great guy in the history if you read about him. He was born sickly, and uh, through his exercises and kind of diving into the ice ice holes and stuff and doing this and this, he kind of uh, turned out to be, um, you know, a great strategist and tactician. And what was his name again? And his, and his rank, military rank, give there's his, only him. Give his name again. His name is Alexander. Suvorov. Suvorov, okay. And he uh, he defeated the Napoleon early on in the end of uh, 18th century uh, and uh, Napoleon's marshals, whatever, how many, two or three of them that he... Uh, he never lost a battle in his life, never, uh, which is amazing. And all these nations like Bulgaria, Romania, um, all this Macedonia... You know, Montenegro, a bunch, and, and the part of Italy owe his uh, owe him their uh, stateship because he beat o- o- Ottoman Empire uh, from here to high heaven. You know, mm-hmm. but uh, anyway, so back to bayonets. So the bayonets were stabbing weapon to begin with, although uh, probably initially it was a sword blade attached to a musket and then it was a stabbing weapon which was like more of a pike right a triangular or or just sort of like a a spike a a spike a socket look at there you got one right there like a four four four-sided this thing's i i think if you give you know i think they like outload by geneva convention or something because it makes that kind of puncture wound that's not doesn't heal well. Uh, Soviets never signed uh, the Geneva Convention, so they can meet, they continued to use those through the World War II and a little past it. But development of the blade was all okay. So you needed the pike, right? You needed to stab at the cavalry and stuff and defend yourself and your lines. And so they were somewhat. I mean, they were pretty long. Yeah, and they stayed like this as far as the length is concerned, all through this history until uh, turn of well, uh, the whole, 20th the century. The whole thought behind that again was, like you said, for cavalry, and then so that you could 
you could get to the opponent before they could get to you. So you'd have a longer Exactly. Reach. And, you know, the training, the bayonet training has been a part of military training. Even I was trained on bayonet fight fighting. Uh, and it was, uh, I don't know where, when it start, uh, stopped at the U.S., you know, in the U.S., I'm not sure about it. I think it's recent event, maybe probably 80s. Maybe they stopped uh, teaching soldiers with the bayonets, although they continue to issue um, like an M9 and an M7 before that. Uh, but uh, the legitimate training, I think, is no longer performed. And uh, But anyway, in any case, so then as we went through the history, then we see that uh, the swords returned, meaning legitimate swords, like meaning the, the actual fighting weapon, like this one, it's the, uh, it's the English um, bayonet for uh, number one, Mark uh, three. Okay, and this thing right here is nothing less than a freaking sword. How many I mean, inches can, is that? Uh, like sixteen inches? World War World War One, World War Two. Correct. Eighteen. So, it's probably eighteen. Is that an Enfield? Was that was that going yeah, on it's Enfield? Yeah, Enfield, but it's uh, ma- I don't know who it's made by. There's a bunch of crowns and stuff here, and some weird. And I think it's made in uh, 1907 Hold or it up. 18. I'm sorry, 1918. Hold it up. A, a leather scabbard. Leather. Wow. Yeah. So, um, hold the markings up you were looking at. We'll see those. Kind of tilt it. There you go. Yeah, I still can't see them. You got to work on your lighting. Anyway, it's like cross and a bunch of those exception, uh, you know, acceptance uh, stamps with the crown and stuff. Yeah. So, U.S. had um, the 1903 bayonet, right? And it was... Correct me if I'm wrong. Sixteen incher. And Sixteen or eighteen. Rich, you're muted, so uh, unmute yourself there. You were wrestling papers, so I muted you. Yep, I'm. I'm done so uh, papers. <laughs> here's one. Here's He's right. one. Already shortened version, which is like what fourteen inch. And uh, by the way, this this one's seen some action, and I was just shown earlier. You can see the spots on it. Yeah. Got a little blood on there, a little blood stain. Yep. It's been broken in. <laughs> yep, just barely. <laughs> Is there a story behind that one? No, it just, um, I uh, picked it up in one of the swap meets um, by accident. And I, I, didn't, I didn't think the guy knew what he, uh, what he had. So, all right. So, although they, other than British, which is, um, if you look at this, Tip. What's your elbow? Darn it. Uh, United States Marine Corps cupboard. It's hooked up on my thing. Yeah. You look, it's more of like a kind of knifey blade, right? So it's yeah. got... A little higher. No, the all you look for, I'm talking about the tip of it. Yeah, okay. Okay? So it's kind of got the legitimate belly, so to speak, right? And then, um, but then when you look at... Uh, let's say 1903, it's more of a spear point, right? Mm-hmm. Like a dagger. Yeah. And it continued to be such all through uh, the, up until the, the U.S. adopted the uh, M9, right? So in 1986, if I'm not mistaken, Rich? Actually, they say that, but that's incorrect. It was actually a 97 officially. Oh, okay. uh, they were they were working on it uh, uh, since '94. In fact, that's actually when Doug Olson stumbled on the document that uh, a U.S. Army uh, general was pissed off that the Russians have a really nice bayonet and we haven't up- upgraded ours. Um, uh, and and to be fair, he didn't say it was actually really nice. He just said a bayonet, a more modern bayonet. So, well, that's. Uh, yeah, so more like a multifunctioning thing rather than just a stabbing weapon. A hundred percent. So that that's the biggest difference, I would say, about all the bayonets that we're talking about now. 
to when you fast forward to the 80s to the buck uh, uh, to the buck made uh, Frobis M9 bayonet, it was a multi-purpose tool is what they actually called it. Yeah. Right. So anyway, and it continued. So the, here, here is a M1 Garand, right? It's a, what is it? M, M5. So it's got kind of the same uh, dagger type uh, yeah. tip. So is the M7, uh, you know, M7, the, the original M16 bayonet. It's almost, the blade is almost identical, right? So then... Uh, if you go to other nations other than U.S., so let's say you go to Germany during World War II, here's a K-98 bayonet, and it is also spear point, right? Now, if you go to Russia, other than um, M-9130s, you know, most of the guns, which still retain that a pig sticker, which, by the way, most of the soldiers in like a regular line uh, units and the uh, um, rifles, regiments and stuff, they just kept them on. And uh, and because of that, um, 9130 was actually sighted with the bayonet attached. OK, so it makes sense. And it's uh, it came from the side. Right. So and uh, from on the right side. So if you would remove it, so obviously you would have to, yeah, you have to make um, it's, holdover adjustments. It's a, it's a bitch to get off once it's on there tight. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's got it, the plunger, you know. Yeah. Uh, little, let's go back a little bit plunger. and let's talk about the different ways that they were attached because originally they were plugs and they just went right into the barrel. Right. And then, of course, they realized that uh, that's no good because it renders uh, um, your weapon useless. Yeah. It turns it effectively into uh, a pike. Well, let's let's and talk then, about uh, why that, they that didn't let, let's talk about why they did that, though, because the bayonet, I mean, it was kind of like your last resort kind of kind of deal. You're either out of ammo or it's it's gotten to the close quarter <laughs> combat at that point. So that's kind of not they really didn't. not really, though. Uh, yeah. Because uh, you know, remember in uh, in those days, you fire one shot, maybe two, and then it would be the enemy would be advancing, and you will be advancing, and then eventually you'll come to to a bayonet slugfest. Right. But so it wasn't really a last resort. It was actually your main weapon to uh, you know the, route the your British. Enemy. The British regulars were famous for the use of the bayonet. And yeah. so much so that if you know the about the uh, uh, Bannister Tarleton, he actually at one and during it was the Battle of Kings Mountain or no, it wasn't Kings Mountain, but it was one of them where he ordered his troops to remove the flints from their uh, yeah from their uh, brown that, best, yeah. and so that nobody would fire a shot, they would only have the option of stabbing the enemy to death. <laughs> and and uh, they were right. extremely That's... effective, it, and it was terrifying. And they were, you know, the British officers would give a command, give them a sword, you know, like uh, if they see there's a stalemate in the way of them just kind of exchanging the pot shots, they would say, all right, it's time to give them a sword. And which means attach the swords and affix the swords and go and uh, I'll poke a few bellies with it. And uh, so it was the main weapon. The bayonet was the main weapon at that time until the onset of the repeating firearms, the ones that you can actually shoot repeatedly at the fast, uh, somewhat fast rate of fire. Now, this is a Russian bayonet from World War II. This is a Tokarev, SVT-40 Tokarev bayonet. And if we look at the, uh, the spear, again, it has a spearhead, just like a Mauser. But the Russian bayonet, this, this particular one, stands apart from everything else that I've just shown, the German, the American, the English. And the way it mounts, it mounts with the edge up. Okay? So it's a single edge, sharp, sharpened edge up. Whereas, let's say, you take the Mauser bayonet, it, it mounts 
with the sharp edge down. Okay, and so is the M1 Garand, so is the 1903. All of them mount with the edge, sharpen edge down, but in this case, you also got the little uh, sharpen edge up top. The reason why Russians did it is because if you have that stabbing motion when you're being trained on bayonet, right? And that's literally, I mean, first of all, when, you know, the body would react, the human body reacts, it, the mus muscles tense and it's hard to pull out, right? So you trained stabbing, penetrating through all that gear, the leather, possibly leather. Yeah, there you go. The AK, AK bayonet's always mounted with the edge up. And what happens is it's sort of like the, if you would imagine, right, here's the bayonet going into the enemy's body, mm -hmm. right? Your natural movement would be to pull it up this <clears throat> way and the edge would slice through whatever you got there yeah. in, in the way. Make it easier Instead pull of pulling it with the thicker, you know, uh, the, the spine of it, Right, which doesn't cut, I mean, cut anything. So you're going to have to redirect and pull it. Yeah. The other Unless way. Unless your natural is the thrust is up. That's right, and pull it up. Unless you're coming so, overhead. Then. Anyway, so that's the difference. And then that difference actually uh, went and kind of transcended through the times. And like Paul was showing the type uh, type two bay uh, type two bayonet. <laughs> And it was mounted on the AK, and then it's mounted blade up, like so. Mm -hmm. Where is yep. where is uh, M9 bayonet that was shamelessly copied from the the Russians? <laughs> Still mounts with the blade down. Okay. I can tell you why that is. Okay. Uh, because the and going back to can I touch up here? We don't. I don't know when we stopped teaching bayonets. Well, let me tell you what, when I was in, in the Marine Corps in the 80s, uh, in the 90s, we they still taught bayonets. Oh, okay. We still did bayonet yeah. training. Yeah. Uh, and I believe the Marine Corps itself still it, conducts bayonet training. I would be sad to find out that they didn't. But the, there was uh, five attacks that you were taught with, the, uh, with a bayonet-mounted rifle. There were five attacks. There was the stab... And then there was the slash, and they would teach you to come up and down and slash. That is why the belly is up. You know, the, the standard bayonet is just, I hold it at my waist level, and I invest at the enemy, and I poke, 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 right? Uh, but in the Marine Corps, and I'm sure the, the Marine Corps, the Army did the same thing the Marine Corps used to do, was they, they had that slashing motion. And so if they were to reverse it, the slashing motion would basically be, it'd be, mood, it'd be a moot point. So well, I'm sure that that, that that design keeps with the, the way that they had been training. And I'm, they probably had been training like that since they put edges on the bayonets for well, hundreds it, of years. It makes sense, although... You know, one could argue saying, okay, if the person has the same thing, you know, charging at you the same way, so the slashing motion would be easy to defend against by just, you know, blocking it and so on, rather mm -hmm. than straightforward poking, <laughs> stabbing motion. Right, but I mean, but, you, you'd poke and slash, and then they would do your butt stroke, you know. Right. And that, that's, you know, that's why they put steel. There's two reasons they put steel butt plates on military rifles to keep the privates from breaking them and to smash skulls <laughs> open. Yes, that's true. And also uh, bust through the doors and mm. smash the locks and all that stuff, all that good stuff. But anyway, yeah. so continue on. So we got to the point where um, bayonets starting to look more like knives, right? The shorter uh, M1 Garand is pretty much a modern length bayonet right and the blade like paul was saying this is the one that he had as a young kid and uh, loved this knife go hunting and everything with it i mean it's sharpened look at that blade i mean it, it's it's great and uh so it's carried on 
to M16s in Vietnam and whatnot when they uh, carried the M7s uh, and stuff. And now um, here comes the Russians, right? After the, I mean, during the last year of war, <clears throat> war they came up with this great rifle, right? So that's the SKS. Yeah. But it was kind of dead on arrival because AK, AK was already being developed. And SKS had this stabbing thing again. Not, not edged at all. It's not sharpened and whatnot, but it's a stabber. Right? There's nothing here. Slash or no slash. It's just a poking straight through right. the uniform and through the body. And uh, the very first AK bayonet had a kind of similar blade but longer and it, it was not foldable that's Chinese invention that goes back to the 60s but uh, it was detachable but it wasn't really it's not a knife it's really becoming something piece of equipment that you carry like this thing or like this British um, uh, number four thingy. This thing is just. Huh. <laughs> it's like a it's nail. A tent, like, it's like a giant poker. nail. Yeah. <laughs> but it's lighter. It's easy to attach. It's easy to kind of carry in this tube on your belt. Yeah. That's kind of weird. And. Anyway, so it becomes this useless thing that's one more thing you have to carry on you and, and bring it uh, with you. Hey there, Leadhead Brigade. Lefty here with some important news for you. Forecasters from the University of Arizona warn that 2023 will be a very active hurricane season, and they're asking people to get prepared. They're expecting the number of major hurricanes this year to be similar to 2017, which saw the extremely intense and damaging hurricanes that we all heard about, Harvey, Irma, and that nasty old Maria. How bad can it get? Well, when Hurricane Ida hit the Gulf Coast, it destroyed countless homes and left many without access to food, clean water, millions lost power. Most didn't have power for weeks. The floods that followed the hurricane washed out the roads, made it impossible for grocery stores to restock their shelves. Families were left hungry and desperate, waiting for help that was slow to arrive. But what if you didn't have to be reliant on the government, FEMA, your neighbor, grocery stores during these crises? The answer is simple. Be prepared with emergency food kits from 4Patriots. Their long-lasting, delicious food options are specifically designed to provide you and your loved ones with the sustenance you need when you need it the most. 4Patriots survival food kits are hand-packed in the USA. They last 25 years. They come packed inside covert storage totes. They include a wide variety of delicious breakfasts, lunches, dinners. They've even got some snacks that are tasty. And they're backed by thousands of five-star customer reviews. Just go check out their website, 4 and read them for yourself. 4 survival food is not just for natural disasters, because in today's world of uncertain supply chains and unpredictable emergencies, it's more important than ever to have a backup plan. Whether it's a temporary power outage, a winter blizzard, or rising food costs, which we're all feeling that these days, right? You can rest easy knowing that you have a reliable source of food to see you through it. And right now, you can go to 4 and use this exclusive code, LEADHEAD, all caps, LEADHEAD, one word, to get 10% off your first purchase on anything in the store, not just their food kits. So go check them out, 4 Use the code LEADHEAD to get 10% off your first purchase of 4 Patriots Survival Food. That's 4 guys. Use the code LEADHEAD and get that 10% off. Now comes the, you know, a few people got together and they said, why don't we make a knife bayonet? And this way we have to issue it to everyone. And everyone carries it as a knife if they have to have a knife and they have to fight, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat and also a bayonet. And that's where this, uh, Paul, you have that uh, type one with the metal scabbard. So they're becoming more. Oh, oh this one. Yeah, the type one. More multi-use is what they're becoming. Right. So that became the, the first iteration. Then 
this is looks like a Romanian or something because the leather frog. Yeah, it's got a it's got a leather frog, but it's got the uh, the nylon strap. I've right, got one right. with leather that's hundred percent leather, and one with nylon. Yeah, the Russians always had that little suspension system, and the reason for that is because it's so easy; it just dangles on you. It's sort of like a uh, Finnish puko knives. They just dangle there, and then you sit down anywhere, you walk through anything, touch anything. It just kind of swings out of the way, and you don't have to. So it's a kind of easy suspension mm -hmm. type of deal. And you got a so, bake light one there, don't you? What's that? That one's bake light. The one you have. Right, so this is a Type 3. So Paul is holding a Type 1, and there was a transitional model, which actually had the square um, cap, right, on the back. Pommel. and But it still had a metal scabbard with the uh, the rubber sleeve. And reason for that is because it, does, it did became a multi-tool. And I explained. So obviously, yeah, like that. Obviously, we see a few things on this blade. So we have the saw, right? The back and of the saw. That, yeah. And we have that uh, hole in it. Yeah. So what happens is this particular hole, you know, you got a certain shape tip of your scabbard, mm -hmm. right? And you got the little... Um, oh, um, up there, Paul. We can see Paul's. Hold it up. Yeah. So and then you just marry the two, and you got yourself a wire cutter, right? Yeah. So now they've they've implemented the scabbard as part of the the implementation right. of tools. And now see the the reason for the uh, um, the rubber grip on the metal scabbard was to cut the uh, wire that's wire. actually <laughs> electrical wire. So and right going. here they made a, the entire scabbard out of bakelite. Yeah. And that's it. But here, here's it's insulated. Thing. They insulated the the scabbard. Right. Exactly. And the knife handle. Then you take and you go like so. So now you, you inserted. You got yourself a pick or you got yourself a hammer. Yeah. And you inserted the, um, is that the bevel? What is that called? The, the, the barrel guard. ring. The baronet barrel, ring. Yeah. Barrel ring. Into the, In, the scabbard into itself. Into the scabbard. And then you've got your ice pick. And then it becomes a, a hammer. Hammer from the or pommel the pick. or a pick from the blade. Okay. I did not know that. That's cool. All right. So then we, uh, then Vietnam happens. And respective parties capture each other's bayonets. Right. So the Vietnamese capture some of the M7s. And send them to the Soviets, or give them to advisors, and and then uh, the of course the American GIs they captured some of the uh, the Soviet supplied AK bayonets, and like we discussed before, both parties go at it. Russians come up with the AK seventy four in nineteen seventy four, and this is the the original. AK-74s were issued with the Type 3, with Bakelite, knife-like uh, bayonet. And it's literally, from now on, it's called a knife bayonet. It's not just called bayonet. It's called knife bayonet. Okay. And then they came, so then once they start dressing their AK-74s in the, in the 80s, in the early 80s, into their plum um, guys, I guess, or furniture, they come up with this bayonet right here. And it's, as you can tell, it's different. It's uh, it's a lot different. Yeah. First of all, the handle is thinner and it's got grooves on it. So it's with the gloved hand that you, you know, in Russia, you got, you got to use gloves for like six months out of a year. So it's easy, easy to handle <laughs> and look at the, and look at the blade. Oh, wow. It's a spear point. Spear point, and it's uh, so it's but is that one side sharp? One edge. The one side has an edge, though, still, right? Just one side, and okay. then you still got the saw, which is a little bit more of a saw than it was on the other one. The other one was more of a file, yeah, it's more aggressive on this. 
uh, just a saw saw. And of course, the it retained its um, wire cutting capability because it was still an issue, uh -huh. right? To attached to the spear. And but it's a spear point now, right? So what do uh, Americans do? They come up with the M9 <laughs> slightly later, right? So now. Yeah. Right. Look at You're this muted, blade, Rich. right? Unmute and, uh, but I'm pretty sure that so uh, as always, Russians Russians stole this design from M9. I'm pretty sure. Rich, unmute yourself. <laughs> Rich, you're muted. All right. Sorry. So uh, having, the the, the saw that. on the back, the wire cutter, the blade, but. The difference is, look at the width of the blade, the thickness of a blade. This is... Uh, the M9 is thicker. A much thicker, much wider. Can it be used as a, as a knife, per se? Yeah, I guess you use, I suppose you can. But not as much as this one, because this is more of like a bowie. I mean, look at the uh, similarities, for example, with the... Uh, Mark III Navy fighting knife. Yeah, right? it's got that really exaggerated swoop at the the tip of the blade there, and it's got the saw and everything. The only thing that's missing is that hole. Yeah, pretty much. So, um, but the would end... make it a good fighting knife. I mean, uh, the round handle. That's usually no no because it would you you would not know how to index your oh, your edge and handle. stuff. Yeah. And uh, I don't know what they tried to say by that. Probably but Rich, Rich does. Do you know why they did that, well, Rich? Uh, why, why they went with the round handle? Yeah. Um, not specifically. There was a, a, a whole bunch of different handle shapes, and this roundish handle um, uh, led for more people's hands. So you could have guys with smaller hands or bigger hands, and they all fit this, you know. Um, also, it was a, a way for them uh, – the handle actually, the shape of the handle, the the, the little you know uh, grounds and everything in it mimic the old uh, Buckmaster. So because they started, they made the M9 bayonet based off the Buckmaster. So if you look, yeah, see, there's uh, another one. But um, uh, at least the Americans use this a lot as a multi-purpose, specifically even just a, a knife. I had a lot of friends that, that were in the first golf, and they used to use this. They loved it just as a knife. No. So, yeah, that was Yeah, uh, I mean, there's no, no, no doubt as a knife, per se, right? It's a yeah. huge, huge improvement, even to yeah. compare to the M7 I mean, yeah. so, and stuff. And, and, uh, so, another, another big thing, Marco, not to cut you off, sir. Is oh, no. you know with with the wire cutter now it's kind of difficult to do this upside down for me, but with the American uh, wire cutter that that was designed here, um, they they purposely made it so you could cut wire with just these two parts. The original ones that they were competing against that the Russians were making, you had to use the full gun, so you had to leverage the full AK with no the, no no that that's no. that's funny they, <laughs> no. It just, was difficult. Just they, anybody uh, will tell you this stuff, Rich. Uh -huh. Just uh, tell them that you're going to curse their eyes. <laughs> no. I will. Well, coming from a Spetsnaz, that's, right. we can say that, right? right. But the big no, thing was that the ease, the ease of cutting was a lot easier with this knife uh, compared to the AKs at the time and the, uh, the bayonets, the Russian bayonets at the time. I, I know that for sure. I've seen all the tests. But it's... Uh, it's just well, anyway. it, 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 yeah. Anyway, anyway, no, it's more it's a, of a multi. So you got a yeah. little screwdriver right here, yeah, and you got and you got a little sh Sharper on knife. yours. The one you yeah. showed had a little pocket for uh, for uh, a sharpening stone, but on the newer I, ones, they had. Uh, oh, it did have that. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Um, uh, what this pocket was, it was actually for a. a it was for a magazine, and originally this, they designed it to fit uh, a Buck Model 110, 
and a Beretta uh, at the time, a Beretta magazine. Uh, magazine. So okay, that was. Cool. But anyway, so they start doing this, and we'll return to it in a second. So this is a sharpening stone. Um, and on this particular scabbard, and I don't know, you got the same one? Uh, you ha you yeah. have this loops right here? Yeah. To yes, sir. Yeah. Leg, leg strap. Yeah. So huge improvement. But yet, if you take this and weigh it, I mean, it's oh, a yeah. huge Heavy duty. I mean, it almost weighs. Like, it's heavy. It feels like twice. So it's a tool. As much, and it's even, a multi tool. Even compared to the the Soviet one, because they're digging weighs, holes with those things and all kinds of and me, different stuff. I can tell you this: pumping all that shit up and down the mountains, you know, <laughs> with the weight, you trying to cut as much as you can. So, moving on. In the uh, um, 90s, right? So the 100 series of AK comes out, right? And now it's no longer plum clad, it's black, right? So they come up with the new black bayonets. I forgot to mention that it's no longer, although you can still, you can't even insert the ring in anymore. Oh, they took that it's away. It's no longer the hammer. And if you want to use it as a pick, use it as a pig because this is more of like a, a you know, it's a spear. So, and let me ask you this, Marco: Why did why did they do plum? Why the uh, why okay. the plum color? Okay, some people say, and I'm every time they say it, and I'm laughing at it. They say the Russians couldn't come up with the black plastic. I don't know. Russians flew a freaking space up into space. They built a freaking space station. They couldn't come up with the black mixture. The reason why the the orange bakelite was chosen is because it, at the time the polymers, the strong polymers, were not well developed at the time, and the, and then they chose this, and also to match the uh, AK. Um, Furniture, right? Which was made of laminate, kind of reddish lacquer, mm -hmm. lacquered uh, furniture. And if you take, let's say you take M4 and you take AKM, <coughs> right? And you go into the, the, against any kind of like life fans or any kind of brush or something, you put two of them right there and, you, and then you bring somebody up and ask to find, uh, point out the two guns leaning against the bush. They'll find M4 first every time because black doesn't exist. A true black does not exist in nature. It's okay. always the shade. And orange and brown is a natural colors in nature. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and say that they use plum just not to use black. They thought it fit as camo they start, better. Is that what's what that? you think? The, so it's better camo, the plum. I'm thinking it's like keeping up with that tradition. But, but in any case, okay. the black came out because it was at the time uh, Ishmash, the manufacturer of AKs, they were looking for other markets. The Russia was just, the Soviet Union just disintegrated. Russia was in the poor shape. And there were no orders uh, from all these arsenals. And uh, so they were looking at, the commercial sales and the, the commercial market was outside of the borders of Russia. And uh, so they made the uh, AK in uh, 101 and 102 in 556 and trying to uh, pedal it around the world, which they successfully did. And then, of course, they decided to just go all the way across with the black. But it, now, yeah, there you go. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have the type. I don't have the original AK-47, which is up top, the first three of them. And as you can see, the blade is identical to that of, uh, of uh, uh, SKS. Yeah. Right? And then, of course, you're missing the one that's, uh, well, Paul has the one with the metal scabbard and a rubber insulator. And then transitional model. And I don't know what that what that freaking thing is on the bottom. This one? Yeah. I it, don't even know what that is. It is. 
Let's see if it tells up here. Oh, I know what that is. I know what that is. That's the, you know, when Bulgarians started to make their own stuff, uh -huh. they made that uh, uh, sort of hybrid. Clip-on uh, clip kind of thing? Milled, milled, milled receiver gun. Yeah. Trying to modernize it, and I think that's what that is. It's basically the same same setup as the top three. If you can see, see those? Yeah, that right there. And uh, yeah, but for more modern dressed, right? As a modern. So the and one more, I'm done. So uh, I'm hogging this time here, and I again I feel terrible. <laughs> Don't you're wonderful. I this can tell. Really yeah, good good information here. Okay. All right. Well, here, here's one that's made out of vanaptanium, right? So uh, AK-12 was adopted uh, as a main battle rifle for uh, Russian military recently. And, uh, you know, it, it's got a few improvements and stuff over the 74, still fires the same round. But the new bayonet came out. I have... Here in my hand, I have the civilian version of it, meaning um, it also issued to like a tankers and people that don't expect to go into, you know, uh, bayonet charges. But here's the new AK bayonet. So this is like 2023, huh? More like 2021. But that's the, 20, they're still issuing so, it now. And now. Okay, few things. Again, it's re, re, uh, remains a multi-tool. So instead of doing the blade and scabbard, they now got the actual wire ah, cutter. Ah, look at there, built into the scabbard. Right. Nice. And see this sharpener stone. Well, it's a it's a West diamond stone. plate. Diamond plate. Yeah. Diamond. Yep. Yeah. And then when you take it out, this is more of a a fighting knife, right? Yeah. The blade. So it's got thick spine, it's got sharpened uh, top of the spine, and then you got the, uh, like it looks like Scandinavian grind with a couple of dolts. It's really light, rubberized handle, so you can easily index it. And it's got the window buster, window buster. the glass buster. Let me right listen, the show us the, um, the handguard on the knife. The handguard. The handle. The handle, the oh, top the of the handle, whatever that thing's called. So it's not very it's not very aggressive there. It's just a little bump to keep your fingers from going up on the blade. But the attachment point is the exact same as the originals? Yeah. Same exactly. It would point. attach an AK-74. So yeah, I don't have the ring right here, right? And I don't have a mechanism. But other than that, it will attach to... Uh, so they remove the ring and the mechanism and sell it as a fighting knife. And also they issue it to like, a, you know, tankers and artillery crews and non-infantry guys. And what's the model yeah. number on that? What's that? What's it called? What's the name? Uh, it's called the Campo. Campo. Knife. Campo. K-A-M-P-O. Campo. That's a company that has been building the knives for like a Russian equivalent of Navy SEALs for divers and stuff. And then they got the contract for the bayonets. So it comes, it comes fully. Yeah, it comes fully. Um, it's got like a Cardura case, which is a camo case with the Moly attachment. So you can put it anywhere you want. And it comes with the leather shit, like a very similar to Puko knives, like with the dangler. And also like a straps to your leg if you want to strap it somewhere or somewhere. So now does it that's the it also but you're saying that that one doesn't have it, but they have the attachment so it will go on the, the rifle. On the rifle, yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. So that's this, but uh, let's talk about uh, the actual second um uh second purpose of a bayonet right or bayonet knife and that is a fighting knife an infantry fighting knife i mean you're going into trenches you go into uh the extreme close combat and you gotta have 
a weapon. Now hold on one second. Paul and and Rich, if y'all have things to say, just talk. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I just want to stop. Hey, Mar go. Marco, I I want to hit on one thing with their new wire cutter that's on the scabbard. Uh, uh, that an idea like that was actually originally with the M9 uh, uh, bayonet with the first submission, but it was war It was too heavy. So they got rid of that, and then they went back to to this idea, which but, makes um, perfect sense. Yeah, yeah, but it was uh, when I saw that, I was like, "Oh my goodness!" Uh, Doug Olson's the guy who was really, really big into doing wire cutters. Matter of fact, when we were doing development of the latest Buckmaster <laughs> two point combat diver, he wanted to put a wire cutter <laughs> on on the knife. That's how much he loved doing the wire cutters. But when I saw that, even the hook on it, it's amazing. But um, they they made a set uh, uh, about ten of them or so for the seals, uh, and then they used that idea and 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 went even further with the M nine uh, uh, bayonet. That it was actually the X M nine number twenty nine to be exact number that had the scabbard with the wire cutter on is just really cool. But when that I saw that, it. I was just like, I thought that was neat. That is cool. I like it. Yeah. So. Uh... Just to give you an idea of where this guy's got the idea. So during the Soviet times, uh, the special forces like Spetsnaz was armed uh, with two knives, right? One was just a knife. It was called NR-1. And then, and then there was NRS-1. And the difference between the two were, uh, NR stands for like a Russian abbreviation for scout knife, just for the scouts or reconnaissance guys, like let's say reconnaissance knife. And uh, the the difference why the other one was called S is for shooting. <laughs> it was silent shooting knife that actually fired out of uh, the butt. Oh, of it, yeah, right? I've seen those. The yeah. ballistic knife. Yeah. yeah, it's not a ballistic knife. Ballistic knife is oh, shoots oh. the uh, blade. This one actually oh. fired the bullet, the oh. seven six two. Oh, misunderstood. Oh, I've was, seen uh, pictures of that before. Right. Yeah. It was. Um, um, it's it's like a plunger inside the casing, so it's natural. It's it's actually a silenced ammo that it fired, so you didn't need the silencer. Did right? it shoot out of the the butt? subsonic? Sub yeah. yeah. Well, it's uh, it so picture casing without the bullet, right? Yeah. And the bullet is inside here, and what propels the bullet is this piston that is here. So when it piston moves forward and hits the round and sends it out, it also blocks it at the neck point and retains all the gases inside. So you don't hear the explosion. And what caliber was that that they were shooting? Seven six two. Okay. Really? Wow. So uh, it fired that thing, and of course, I don't know if practical use of it was even, you know, I mean, it was good in movies, was, but never. The, yeah. yeah, in the <laughs> movies and uh, in the advertisement videos or things like that. But their scabbard, uh, both shooting and non-shooting version came with this thing. So, Marco, do you still have your ballistic knife that you were issued? <laughs> no, but I have certain things. <laughs> I have certain issued. things. <laughs> but I do have a knife that I was actually issued. If you want to see that, I'll show it to you. Well, I was just curious because I have another friend who had a, uh, a ballistic knife, and he said that never one time did they ever shoot the blade at <laughs> Yeah, no. <laughs> but, it's, uh... but it look yeah. It was so scary that they had that the was it the did they did the ATF make them illegal they banned, or do they just ban them yeah, from I, import? I, they banned sure them from banned. import. I know some people. I mean, you, you find the videos on YouTube's that uh, um, actually have uh, you know demonstrate those knives. So they are around spring loaded thingy. Oh yeah, back in the '80s, I knew someone who had. Yeah, one. let me let me show you what that was issued. I bet uh, Sonny's got one, doesn't he? <laughs> Too many things. My thingy gets caught on it. <laughs> my thingy. 
Your thing gets caught on the thing. There you go. All right, so this is the knife. It's called NR40. So, again, reconnaissance knife. Um, Sounds like a vaccine. 1940. It was developed in 1940. Okay. So, it's an uh, interesting knife. So, reconnaissance knife. Here's 40. the blade. Here's the wooden handle. It's, uh, but look at the S guard, right? And if you look at the S guard, it, it's not conducive holding the knife this way. It's conducive to holding a knife this way. So, and the reason for that is stab and then pull back. Just like, sort the, of bayonet like the bayonet. Trend. Yeah. And if you reverse hold it, then naturally, of course, you've got the blade towards you, you know, pulling back. And, uh, and so they made a sign for this thing, like, because it was secret freaking weapon. And I'm talking 1985, you know, wooden scabbard with the metal cap. That's a knife. Another one for um, some other guys that carry this, including some Navy. Same blade. Same blade. Yeah, but it's already got the straight guard on it, and it's got rubberized yeah. um, handle and a little cap right here to hit somebody in the head with. <laughs> but uh, this was called, he had a nickname, Cherry. Cherry. And, <laughs> yeah, and the, most of them came with the green, bright green uh, handles and the leather scabbard like this. But that's nothing but the fighting knife. And this yeah. this knife is actually copied from... Uh, a Swedish knife called, I want to say, uh, Gar Garlsberg blade. Okay. But it's also going back to like a Puko knives in Finland. And that's why it was called, always called a Finca or like a Finnish knife. Yeah. And I, I have the, I have both of them. I have the, the actual, I think it's a martini if I'm not mistaken, or Yarvan Pau or somebody, the Finnish knife. Here and I have the actual NKVD Finca, which is knife was issued to NKVD troops during the war. And that thing is oh and before the war. And that thing is well, let me see if I can get it so Okay. While you're know doing that, um Rich and Paul, tell us some things maybe about the the American bayonets that's not well known to, to listeners. Well, I think uh a, a few things, just like uh, Paul already pointed out, that the M9 bayonet was replaced by the the OKC uh, 3S uh, by the Corps and the Marine Corps. At you know, I, I have a whole chapter in my book that is showing the development for the the Marine Corps because uh, uh, they love their bayonets. I mean, just historically, they're just you know, fantastic warriors. And it's just amazing that, I mean, I even heard of a few, uh, uh, a battle and, and I'm not sure if it, I'm pretty sure it was in Afghanistan when everybody ran out of ammo and they were, they actually did a small storm with bayonets. I don't know, Paul, if you knew that one, if you heard about that, but when I was doing research for my, my book, um, back, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, eight years ago or so, I heard about some particular incident. I don't know if you heard about that. I heard. No, I'm not sure like about uh, about the one in, in Afghanistan, but uh, it the uh, it, something about the bayonets is if people need to understand that we we like to give ourselves this 21st century uh, dr dressing. We're like, oh, we're modern and we have drones and we have this and that. That's great, but when it comes down to it we're still, it's still a rock and stone world. And this, the human being that is wielding the tool is the same human being that was wielding it a hundred years ago and 200 years ago and 300 years ago. It's the same brain. And, uh, it's a, it's a psychological tool. I can tell you this, when, uh, I was on the USS Forrestal and I was part of the Marine detachment. And one of the things well, our primary purpose and mission on that ship was the security of nuclear weapons, the security for the storage, transportation, movement of nu nuclear weapons. And so we had to move around 
the ship's personnel constantly, right? We moved around the ship's personnel constantly. And they were very used to seeing us in full gear, helmets, flak jackets, rifles, shotguns. And it didn't really phase them, right? They didn't see us in with our rifles and shotguns and think, oh, we need to stay away from them. But there were certain times when we needed the ship's personnel to understand that they needed to stay away from us because we were doing important stuff. And when that time came, our, our cap, the captain issued us, well, we always had them, but we would fix bayonets. We would fix bayonets. So when we were moving about and we were on post, we were standing there with a bayonet mounted rifle. And when they would walk by and notice that the eyes, um, yeah. And they they would give us a wide berth because, uh oh, this is different. They don't usually have the sharp pointy things on the end of their rifles, and they do now. We should stay away from them. Uh, a good friend of mine is a retired SF, and he went down to Haiti up in the post uh, uh, the big earthquake deal. When when the, the Haiti had the earthquake, and we sent all these all this money and things down there. And um, he was part of a unit that went down there, uh, acting in, in the army. And he said that the that the natives they would rush them, press against them, try and get to the the food supplies, try and get to. And he said, uh, and the officers finally figured out, tell the men to fix bayonets. And he said, as soon as we fix bayonets, they stop pressing against us because the, in their minds they're like, oh, these guys probably won't shoot us. You know, they're not allowed to shoot us, you know, blah, blah, blah. But you put a sharp pointy thing on the end of the rifle and you hold it out. And the, you know, even even an illiterate person knows I don't want that to be poked into me. And and they will give you a bird. They will stay back from you. Uh, and the, the spirit of the bayonet is to kill, kill, kill with cold blue steel. And that's always been the case. And you don't, and it's like Marco said, the, the bullet is a fool, but they, but the bayonet is a soldier. You know, the bayonet has the spirit. And when you're training people to become fighters, you really don't train people to become fighters through mechanical movements. Like the shooting a rifle is mechanical, you know, shooting a rifle well is mechanical, but that doesn't really translate a fighting spirit. The fighting spirit is translated through the steel. That's how you, that's how you get people. That's why the Marine Corps, I believe, still does. You know, when, when Comrade Barry, remember like 10 yeah. years ago when yeah, Comrade he, Barry came out and he goes, oh, we don't no need that. Bayonets. We, we right. don't issue bayonets anymore. Blah, 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 right. blah. It's like, shut up, Barry. You don't know what you're yeah. talking about. Yep. You know, go back to from whence you came. We we still have bayonets and we'd have them today. And Marty, that's why that's why I designed the LNC rifle like I did, so that a bayonet would fit on it properly. Yeah. I mean anybody who buys a rifle right now, like other than somebody that wants that extended the handguard and all that, they want a bayonet lug. That is considered to be non neutered, non castrated rifle, rifle, yeah. military rifle. And the and, thing is, I, I think the training with the bayonet is essential part of military training. Absolutely. There's marching absolutely. information, the cadences, the songs, you know, all that stuff. It's part of the being a soldier and the discipline. You remember so, any of your cadences? Who, me? Yeah, shout off a cadence for us. <laughs> no, we, <laughs> We had, we had, uh, yeah, of course, it's the typical, you know, sort of like one, 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 two, three. It's like ras, ras, go, or like leve, leve, you know, meaning the left, the left, you know, meaning the left foot forward. Right. And then, you know, but we had songs. We had, uh, we would go and do the songs, like, uh, you know, cadence type of songs. Not, not like a horseman, you son of a bitch, right? Give me one. Give or like me one. a Eskimos, MC <laughs> Very Cold, or whatever it is in the movies. But like something you take a song that everybody knows and you march with it. And marching with the song, especially in the force march, 
and stuff, uh, carrying all kind of shit and stuff. It's a lot easier, believe it or not. I mean, Molly they weren't Ford stupid. and a tank full they of gas. It. What's it? Malay Ford and a tank full of gas. <laughs> you know, but you know the the it full might be jacket. different, but it's it it goes it has the same roots. It grows from the same spot. You know, sure. just different languages, different. Uh, but uh, and uh, I remember, was it in two thousand and five? I think uh, the Americans were actually in the Red Square marching in victory parade, right? You don't. You guys don't remember that. What are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, the the allies, like uh, the French, the French, Amer, you know, Americans, British, and Polish troops, actually marched in the Red Square during Victory Day parade. I think it's 2005, if I'm not mistaken. Here they we go. Celebrated the, 2010, like, uh, World War II. Uh, 60. Is it the U.S. troops marched through Red Square for the first time in a Victory Day parade on Sunday as Russia celebrated its 65th anniversary of the end of World War II? Is that what you're talking about? Right. Yeah. So they marched to a Russian um, uh, marches, the music, right? And the, they didn't skip a step because it's very similar. Yeah. And it, both both cadences and the, the, the steps and stuff come from prussia so the russians copied back in the 18th century copied the prussian discipline and then if you remember during uh uh revolutionary war the uh the army was trained by the prussians yes so true it's very similar anyway i was going to show you the blades again um what are so you showing here's us? the Kuko okay. knife, right? Okay. And here's my fighting knife. And so NR40. Look how similar they are, right? Yeah. That's why they call them Finkus. And then that's Martini. And if you take Isaki uh, Yarampal. What's your language? Kuko knife. And then you take NKVD Finka. It's got the S guard. Well, the guard, but, uh, you know, I mean, look at the blade. It's a little, yeah, a little, very very similar. I mean, it's almost exact copy. And uh, Isaki Yaronpao actually had, when the Finland was part of the Russian Empire, he actually had a stamp from, he could use the crown stamp because he was approved supplier to the court. And look at this thing. Do that at an angle. Yeah, it's got the sickle and hammer on it. Yeah, it's an KVD. And what is this one called? The NKVD? It's an NKVD knife, okay. like a Finca. That was issued to NKVD troops. Nice. Very nice. Stabbing, man-killing man knife. Or maybe you peel potatoes with it, I don't know. You can do things. Skin a deer with it, so... Let's do this. You got anything else to add before we go to our listener questions? I just wanted to touch on the fighting knives and, and how they were, uh, you know, important to okay. history as uh, as the uh, substitute for bayonets. And uh, like one being a good one, a good example, and it's probably one of the best all around knives, even for, you know, if you're a hunter or survivalist or uh, Prepper of some sort, obviously the United States Marine Corps Kabar knife. Yeah. But K-bar. one thing I want to mention, though, <laughs> a lot of people might not know. So this is actually uh, probably like a Bowie blade. Wouldn't you agree, guys? Like mm-hmm. a Bowie yeah, knife. Yeah, similar. So you know, in Finnish knives, they have this dip right here, right? This right part right here, mm-hmm. up top, from the spine. Obviously, it's now been sharpened, and it's kind of helps you to penetrate stuff if you're stabbing or something. But on Finnish knives, it, ne- it was never sharpened. <laughs> you know, it's designed to take the canteen off the fire <laughs> with the knife. I, I was dumbfounded when I found out about it. So uh, we already talked about uh, a Mark III Navy fighting knife, right? 
which I think is um, it's on the heavy side, but I think uh, it's probably close to ideal fighting knife if I would imagine one, right? Let's so the see. blade is uh, very similar to the Russian bayonet, but the handle is oval handle and it's indexing really well. It's got the heavy um, cap on the back. I'll do that. I mean, all, all in all, I'm thinking that that would probably make a, and it is a great fight, fighting knife. And then again, it's got that stupid sew and stuff. I don't it's know okay. what you can sew with it. I mean, so, you'll, you'll be killed 17 times before you cut through like two inch twig or something. <laughs> But um, nevertheless, um, well, and that's about it. That's all. That's all I have. And like, geez, Marco, that was awesome. Well, I'm sorry. I, 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 I say, I love that. And Paul, thanks, man. Let's go for the questions. Let's see what folks have for us. All right. So let me ask you. <clears throat> let me ask you this, Rich. And we hadn't talked about it beforehand. Um, do you want to give away a copy of your bayonet book to one of the listeners? I, I, Absolutely. Yeah, no. And I'll get it autographed by um, uh, CJ Buck. Uh, okay. And uh, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Okay. So there you go, Leadhead. So that's yeah. that's one of it our took, prizes. Uh, it, it was five and a half uh, years of research, and I had the proper nomenclature. I had a SF uh, captain proofread it for me and go through everything, and also a Navy SEAL commander, because uh, I have a whole section on uh, combat utility knives. So, yeah. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Yeah, and talk talk about a little bit about what um, inspired you to do this book. Well, you know what? I I ended up getting like fifty pounds, literally fifty pounds of documents from a guy named Harry Kampisen, who worked uh, specifically for Frobus companies. And when I was doing my research on my uh, Buckmaster book, he the last six months right before I was able to. Uh, 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 last six months before I finished my book, I got all these awesome documents that Mr. Buck said, yeah, give them to Rich. That's cool. And I was so burned out, man. I had four little kids when I wrote my first book. It was back in 2011. And uh, I was like, nah, I got 50 pounds of documents. Matter of fact, it's on the last page. I got 50 pounds of documents. And one day, maybe I'll write them. And I'd be in that book. And I, I got inspired. And Commander Coulter, a SEAL commander, uh, Tom Coulter, He's been retired, on the show. Uh, been on the show a couple yep, of times. He he uh, he inspired me, and then Captain Michael Hawk. Um, he's a uh, SF um, super amazing dude. Uh, he also inspired me, and his beret actually adorns the front cover of my my uh, second book. So, yeah, Is he the guy that cool had that, that survival TV show. Yeah, he did. It's, uh, uh, it's called Man, Woman, and Wild. Yeah, and then he, then he does, and he did that with his wife Ruth. Yeah, I was gonna say uh, he did he it with his hot uh, chick. That was yeah, yeah. That was his wife. Yeah, and uh, he, he's uh, he's done all kinds of stuff on the History Channel as an expert. But he and he's he has a few awesome books too himself. But it's uh, uh, Michael Hawk, and it's spelled M Y K E L H A W K E. But he's awesome. Yeah, so if you guys want to get the book, um, you can go to Amazon. Uh, just pulled it up for our viewing audience, and just pull it up under Richard Nyman, N-E-Y-M-A-N, uh, and then that'll pull up both your books, I guess, that you have there, because you also did one on yeah. uh, the history of the Buckmaster, uh, which I have that here. It's a good book. It, it looks like okay. I'm going to be sending you two. <laughs> one for one for the the viewer and one for yourself, so you have it in your library for the bayonet. Well, I, I won't. Yes, sir. I won't argue with that. I appreciate that. All right, yeah. let's let's go to the list of questions now. First one is from FPS Murdoch. He says, "Is there a difference between an AK-47 bayonet and an AK-74 bayonet, and are they interchangeable?" Paul, you want to answer that one? Well, we we actually just went you you went through that yeah, about thirty minutes yeah. ago. So yeah, it's a um, but but the, the well the great thing and and that's like the 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 interesting thing about the you know what we've done when we adopted the M sixteen we adopted the M sixteen they had to come up with a new bayonet because the the World War Two era bayonets the carbine the M one carbine bayonets so they wouldn't work with it so they came up with the M seven since the M seven the mounting hardware 
the lug, you know, the bayonet lug itself, and then the mounting hardware have remained constant for 60 years. Yeah. You know, whether it's the whether it's the you know the Marine Corps OKC bayonet, or whether it's the M7, or or whether it's the M9, the mounting hardware is identical. Mm-hmm. And so with the AKs, whether it's AKM, AK74, AK100, whatever, the mounting hardware. Check me if I'm wrong, Marco. Is is identical? So you could have a 19, you know, 72 bayonet, and it'll go on a rifle that was produced in 2018. Yeah. That that is correct, but the question itself is not necessarily um, correct one. So, because AK forty seven had that uh, bayonet that was sort of like a detachable SKS bayonet, right? Mm-hmm. So, and it did not have a bayonet log, so it had to go and go and clip around the um, the barrel, and. So AK-47, of course, is in its league of its own with the uh, with the different bay or, or kind of its own a different bayonet. But AKM bayonets will mount on all the modern um, um, rifles. So is the AK-74 style bayonet would mount on AKM. The one thing to mention, so. AK-74 and the 100 series had that um, booster slash flash suppressor, I guess. Mm. It didn't suppress any flash. But anyway, and so they had to have two bayonet lugs, so to speak. And one of them is actually what they call the accessory lug, that which you would clip you under, under a barrel grenade launcher, like GP-25 or GP-30. And... Uh, so it would actually the ring, the barrel ring, go around the tip of that muzzle device, and then clip into the first bayonet log on the AK seventy fours and the hundred series. Yeah. Whereas in the AK, on the um, AKM, it would go around the the muzzle, yeah. and clip into its own uh, bayonet log. But yes, they're interchangeable between AKMs. And AK-74, it's not AK-47, though. Okay. ESOM-87, does anyone know if bayonets are being used in the Ukraine war or when the last AK bayonet was used in conventional warfare? Are they even being issued with new AK rifles? And you answered that um, just a minute ago. So They are issued. I'm not – I can't tell you when it was used last. Um there's like nothing but rumors out there uh, referring to uh, a Chechen campaigns as well as uh, Afghanistan. I myself never experienced that. And then um, Ukraine war, there's a lot of close combat. But I I mean, you can see it on Telegram channel. Uh, clo- I mean, I'm talking about close, close, like to the point where they stick in the muzzle of a gun into each other's belly so to speak but not once i see anyone using any kind of uh um bayonet but i think at that point you'll probably be better off with the with the knife introducing our new belly band holster whether you're hitting the gym or running a quick errand our belly band is one of the most comfortable and safest ways to carry your firearm The center section allows you to carry most common pistols. Left or right-handed, this has you covered. A hard laminate trigger shield protects the firearm's trigger from unwanted intrusion, giving you ease of mind while carrying every day. Two elastic sleeves give you the flexibility to carry other everyday items, such as spare mats, flashlight, knife, or pepper spray. Two zippered pockets run on both sides, offering the option to carry smaller items, such as money, cards, or keys. Flush fit on your lower back or waist, easily keeping your setup discreet no matter how you choose to carry. Utilizing 3D spacer mesh, these channels allow for exceptional and efficient airflow, giving you maximum comfort and keeping you cool. Carry whenever you want, how you want, with our new belly band holster. Available now. Go to missionfirsttactical.com. Use the code LEADHEAD for an exclusive listener-only 20% discount. Um, T. 
Hayden 83 Here's a question slightly outside the box. While the episode has focus on the bayonet itself, is it possible that we are overlooking the manner in which it attaches? Could the bayonet lug introduced on the AKMs be the most useful evolution of the bayonet? What are your guys' thoughts on this? As always, love the show and wishing everyone well. Can I, oh, Absolutely. Richard, anyone? No, no, no. I think you, well, I you mean, got it's, it. It's evolved. It, that's it's kind of what I was. mechanics. Yeah. Well, okay, so. Go ahead. Here's a Mauser attachment, right? So you got your little, um, you know, the track or kind of that yeah. slides over the bayonet log. And then it's you know spring loaded and, and it, it fixes it yeah right and then you got the button you push the button to release it right the where's my svt40 okay svt40 is the same way even this british one that is like a hundred years old or more I mean, it's got to be more than that yeah it is it's 1918 same thing so you got your slot that goes over the bayonet log, and then you got uh, the button to Push release button. it. Now, on the on the later versions of British bayonets, which is like the the Mark uh, and the Model Fours, Mark Ones, and whatnot, there was more of like a it's a twist off type of deal, which had at the tip of the barrel, they had the logs to which it attached. So here's a. Um, AKM bayonet, same thing. It slides over the log, and it's a spring-loaded button that releases it. And more of a modern one does the same thing. So the I guess that's the prevalent way to attach it. Um, even the U.S., like uh, let's say this is uh, M1 Garand, although the button to release it is up front uh-huh. but it still slides over the bayonet log right huh. how it's supposed to be and so they essentially uh all of them are kind of similar other than most of the gans or like sks with the folding bayonets or the uh the british newer britain old rifle newer version of it um but um they essentially uh, use the bayonet as a rail, and then they lock it up with the spring-loaded mechanism. And then you have a button to... Uh, oh, yeah, the U.S. is different. I mean, on the... Um, where's my uh, M... Talk, uh, talk Paul. Uh, M9 and M7 kind of got similar mechanisms, and that's the two side buttons that you squeeze. Yeah, it's got a... And that's... The, and, you know, that design is easily 60 plus years old now but it's 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 robust and it works and it's simple and you know that's what it needs to be uh that's what it needs to be yeah Um, the pinch and that's uh you know it's but in in the core of it is about the same yeah i mean meaning like it's a log you slide it on and then you latch it with the spring okay Corey brown Ask, or is he making a statement here? There are a great all around. They are a great all around tool for stabbing, slicing that bacon, emphasizing what you're pointing at, digging, and in a pinch cut wire when you accidentally get barbed wire wrapped around your axle. LOL. Why is there more bayonets out there that incorporate a wire cutter? I think we just showed they all kind of do that. Yeah, all the modern ones do. Yeah. I'm pretty sure we don't have any of the European ones, like a German or, or British. I don't know. They probably I would follow think, suit. Yeah, they have that too, I would think. Um, yep, they, they do. Raider 214. The reason, oh, go ahead. The, one of the biggest reasons that the that the wire cutters came about, a lot of people are like, oh, it's like the SEALs are cutting through chain link fences and stuff to sneak in. I'm like, <laughs> man, I can't even imagine the amount of time it would take to cut a chain link fence. But one of the biggest things to, that will kill your field knife is com wire. Yeah. Com wire looks thin, but it's a mother lover and it will destroy your blade. People try and cut through com wire. You can cut through 550 cord all day long, 
Uh, but if you're with your field knife, you're not cutting through comm wire. Um, and that's an important thing I mean, because in the grunts, grunts have to deal with that all the time. You know, maybe, maybe some, you know, you know, maybe, maybe barbed wire, or maybe a fence thing or something like that. But the, the biggest thing that I had while I was a grunt, uh, was cutting comm wire. And if you try and use your pocket knife to cut comm wire, you basically just <laughs> killed your, you just destroyed your pocket knife. Yeah. Nine three people tactical. are like calm wire. What is? <laughs> Google it. <laughs> Nine three tactical philosophy of use when it comes to your military training with the bayonet. Is it considered more of a utility tool or a close quarter combat shit? It's the fan weapon throughout training and how it it was actually used in the field. So he's asking when you were trained on it, were you trained more for stabby killy or utility? purposes for it they, they don't train you to do utility stuff no yeah. you figure uh, that out on your own <laughs> right Runs, stabby, just stabby figure stabby out killing. how to make stuff work yeah, yeah. Stabby Runs just figure out how to make stuff work yeah and then how was it actually used in the field with your experiences how did you guys actually use yours open up c rations <laughs> yeah i was going to say yeah. that i have busting, to you, busting open just, crates prying you know, the Rus Russians had those tin cans, right? Those uh, sealed, uh, the ammo cans. Yeah. And it came with the little uh, tool that you can use. And, and you got to, like, you know, use it so many times to be really proficient with that thing. But anyone who did this is, like, probably screwed around with this a, a long time before you, you could open and bend the, the, the top off. Uh, with the uh, bayonet, you could easily go through it a lot faster and time is of the essence when yeah something else i wanted to mention guys yeah. is and i'm sure you you realize this the we went from a time where bayonets were not issued sharp you know if yeah. you wanted this to be sharp when you got it you had to take it you had to grind it you had i mean these things are pretty much like butter knives when they're issued and my experience with these with the M7s has been that it was a toss up. You would get some that might like this one. You can obviously she is sharp and it has a blade, but you would get some that you could run your finger right over. And it was, it was like a butter knife uh, with the new knives, the M9 yeah. uh, and, and the OKCs, the, those come really seriously. They, they focus on the edge. Whereas the original, the old school 50, 60 years, cold war bayonets, they the manufacturers were not screwing around focusing with they weren't honing the edge and cutting newspaper and stuff like that they're like make them and ship them make them and ship them just go and now the you know like this m9 bayonet this mother lover this is an ontario version this mother lover is sharp i mean it's i could shave the hair off the back of my arm with it same thing with the marine corps one so that is that, that, that is a, a big difference in the cold war era manufacturing of bayonets and the modern manufacturing yeah for, for the m9 that was like an operational requirement to be able to cut so many pieces of line um so yeah it, it had to be a particular thickness of line it had to do 100 cuts without going dull and every single knife that buck made over the you know, 300 thousand of them that were issued to the u.s army uh and and uh, core uh long story short they were tested every hundred knives to make sure that that sharpness was there. So that's cool. You hit on that. They, and of course, when I was in service, they catch you doing this, you know, sharp, trying to sharpen. First of all, the blade is a single edge, right? So single grind. Yeah. They, they catch you <laughs> sharpening your bayonet. You, you just got yourself some demerits, <laughs> but, but, Everybody did it anyway. When when the uh, warrant officer, or the CO was not looking, you know. But uh, do you guys know um, as far as metals go? Um, how as far as the bayonets and it, did they use different metals at different times? And I'm sure it's improved over, obviously over the ages too. Well, that's you know the, the this. I'm pretty sure this is salt waterproof. Is it not? Yes, it is. But Marco, it's also this very this is this brittle. is a it's it's a it's a corrosion proof and whereas the 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 U.S. they just use carbon steel, so the U.S. is like we're not going to put any stainless carbon just 
oil it and clean it. And then the, the Russians went the opposite direction. They're like, no, we're actually going to put a, a stainless salt resistant type finish on it. And of course, when you, when you hack down and grind it, you're probably pulling some of that finish off there anyway. But. So not to correct you there, uh, but go Paul, ahead. But on the, on the M9 bayonet, it was stainless. So okay, it was so the, stainless. It was 425 mod stainless steel. It was corrosion resistant. Um, and they would occasionally, uh, uh, Coat it with black oxide, uh, like this coating. Yeah, yeah. But but uh, it, that was indeed. Well, I, I was it, it I was went... talking more Cold War, but oh, sorry, forgive me. Yeah, the well, was, you know, the well but that, that, that that is. I mean, at one point they had this metal, and then they progressed to different metals. Yeah. Oh yeah, these these will rust. Yeah. Yeah, Bad. these will rust. So with this, with the AK bayonets, right? Of course, once you put the blue beret on and then you think you're this super duper commando, although you still got like a green grass growing out of your ass and stuff when you show up, the first thing you want to do is start throwing knives, right? Especially this thing looks like a conducive to throwing knives. <laughs> and uh, you quickly find out because you can't. OK, so you got to practice to learn how the knife flies and the how to where to release it and stuff. So many times you would flat, you know, land it flat like this on the tree or whatever that you're trying to apply wood or something, you're trying to stick with it. And there were cases where the blade snaps. Snap, it was snap. that brittle. And uh, so obviously you're in the world of shit after that. I mean, you'll be uh, KPing for the rest of your service for destroying Mother, Mother Russia's... Uh, Property. 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 <laughs> and uh, so you would do like a, maybe you find like a old ones, which uh, the, some of the infantry took it off uh, some of the Afghanis, the ones with the rounded um, back. You have mm -hmm. one of those, right, Paul? Yeah, yeah. Instead of the metal hammer back like that. Yeah, the bake leg that, handles. And, uh, you'll find out real quick that uh, up to two or three hits that... Uh, a fiber filled bakelite will mm -hmm. chip and break off. Yeah. And they immediately don't, don't the, throw, don't, don't throw, throw your, air, your, your air force survival knife either. Cause your <laughs> air force survival knife will break. Snap. I broke a tip. Ask me how I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And another thing is like one of the best throwing knives really is the AK 47 bayonet. You know, the one that, uh, the old one. Yeah, that looks like a SKS blade. The longer spear point deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let but, me ask uh, you this. This isn't one of our – this is my question too. Um, you know, when we're talking about the metals, I'm assuming that these aren't full tang either. They're um, bayonets. Are there any bayonets that are full tang or are they full tang? Well, it's uh, – Are they faux? Um, this is definitely not because you got to have a mechanism, right? Yeah. Uh, latching it. But I don't know how far it goes. I would assume that it's at least probably uh, two thirds of a tank is encompassed in there. Uh, I would assume that the newer one, the one the AK 12, is actually full tang and you got the thingy sticking out right here for yeah, window glass, busting. Glass breaker. In, uh, in 1993, uh, Buck experimented with a full tank for the Marine Corps, and um, th they actually developed a wonderful, wonderful uh, bayonet in 1996 for the second Army submission that Buck actually won, and it was a full tank. Uh, the only thing is Buck didn't build it because they didn't know if it was going to be 500 or, you know, 100,000. And then Ontario um, uh, kept on rolling with it. But that's the only full tang that I know that Buck ever made. Um, and it was superior. It was amazing. Okay. Well, I was just, I was curious about that. All right. Next question. Um, well, this isn't a question. It's a comment. Fun factoid from Nikolai Aplanap. Rumor has it an M16, M9 bayonet can fit a Sega 12 if you have a lug attachment. Yeah, I've seen people do that. There are some mods. You have to do a little mod, but it'll work. I've seen some guy up here in Idaho do it. I'm sitting here and trying to process the Sega 12 with the bayonet log. 
Well, we have mm. a question down here. It says, uh, from the shaky taster, can I damage the barrel of my Yugo by welding on a bayonet lug? I don't want that pig sticker <laughs> drip. <laughs> okay, okay. I just, a mechanical engineer will tell you right here that, uh, uh, that any welding, meaning uh, basically melting the metal uh, on both sides to a plasma condition and then merging it together, puts an immense amount of heat on both of the parts, right? And that would cause, and the barrels go through a process, the heat treatment process and stuff like that. So you would most definitely will do something to your gun, maybe not geometrically, but you could uh, relax any kind of tempering that's been done or, um, you know, just turn it back into like a, a butter type steel and so on and so on. I would freaking not do it. Yeah, no way. But, you know, better. Don't be recommend better. it. If, if you have to have an AK with a, a mount, just buy one. Just buy the, this This is the, the BFT-47 and it's got the mount. Just, yeah. just, just purchase it. Yeah. Just don't, don't yeah, don't the, screw the original Yugo, but uh, even though they probably they just uh, for import pur purposes, they probably don't import the Yugo guns with the bayonet logs on them, they probably just making them without it. Yeah, but I would just let the Romanians have them. Just, yeah. yeah, they do. Yeah, my washers do. They probably shaved on both sides to uh, give it I, an appearance I, that it's not. I mean, by 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 law, and I imported some, you know, imported mm. guns and ammunition. Uh, you're not supposed well, to. Well, yeah, there's. I mean, that's there's not a lot there. Anyway, you know, when you look at that, when you look at the actual mounting, there's not a lot there. So. But it would still latch, though, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, I've I've latched yeah, so bayonets on the They just got around the importation yeah. by shaving the sides off, but it would still latch. All right. Next question. Be Hurst. He's got a couple here. Uh, what else can fit Bayo lug instead of Bayo lights, rockets, or other? I've seen the, I've seen chainsaws. On the AKs, it's uh, mostly the un underbarrel grenade launchers. Ah, there you go. Yeah, underbarrel grenade launchers. In fact, the second one on the AK seventy four pattern rifle is specifically for that. Flamethrowers, I've seen those. Flamethrowers. It's just custom stuff people have done, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, any problems with shooting with a bayo on? A bayonet on? Unless if it's a plug, <laughs> you don't want to shoot. <laughs> no, it. no. <laughs> it's going to – I'll hit this one first, and then you guys can jump in. But, yeah, um, Wiley Clapp once – you guys know who Wiley Clapp was, right? No. Wiley well, Clapp's still alive, yeah. but – he was uh, he was a, a marine infantry. He was a marine uh, a platoon leader in Vietnam, and he said, "If you he goes the best way to destroy the mark or the accuracy of a platoon is to issue the words fix bayonets, because uh, your your barrel is you know your barrel has a vibration, and uh, it, it's and it you, the gun knows what to do, and the barrel vibrates. And anytime it's like if you laid your barrel on a fence or on a post or anything like that." Your shots are going to be off because you screwed up the vibration of the barrel. Well, when you take a piece of the steel and now you hang this off of the head end of the barrel, you are changing the the, the vibration, the harmonics. the harmonics. You're changing the harmonics of that barrel. So, yeah, it definitely is going to alter it. Uh, how much? It's going to depend on the gun. Uh, with this gun. I noticed this is the B, this is the BFT 47. I noticed a shift at 25 yards, a big shift at 25 yards uh, uh, in the in the impact of the bullets. And it was consistent, but it was a big shift. It was like a huge shift. And like Marco said with the uh, the 9130s that they would just put them on and zero them like that because there is it's like well it's like screwing a, a suppressor onto your barrel. It's going to change the point of impact because uh, you're changing the harmonics. But then you, you go to like, well, what are we, you know, how close are we? You know, 
Yeah. You know, are we 25 yards away? Are we 100 yards away? Are we 1,000? You know, if the enemy is 400 yards away, you probably don't need bayonets. Uh, but if they're 15 yards away, then go ahead and stick it on there and go to town. Yep. Time to put the knife on. There you go. All right. Uh, two more questions here, and then we'll pick a winner. Uh, where'd it go? Where'd it go? Okay. Um, it's about a green something here. Oh, here we go. So, FPS Murdoch, did the Soviet border guards have green Bakelite bayonets? I ask as I've seen pictures of the border guard, green Bakelite mags and furniture, but never a bayonet. If I had to guess, and I'm guessing here, and I'm applying logic. Sure. I'd say no. Those green uh, guns that were issued to border guards, they didn't issue them across. They only issued to the best soldier based on some kind of competition. And it was, it could have been like, let's say, detachment of, let's say, a platoon detachment, what they call it Zastava, right? And uh, there would be one guy with that gun. And not in every not in every platoon, let's say. Okay, so it has to be somebody who could have apprehended uh, uh, a person that crossed illegally, um, which in those times usually would be like a a spy type of person. You know what I mean? And uh, uh, okay, you can't. You look at those magazines, right? Uh-huh. And they obviously been painted. Yeah. And yeah. and the furniture is obviously a plastic. There was no green plastic furniture ever. It was always laminate wood that was painted a stained green and then lacquered. Not plastic. That looks like it's not been painted. It's all painted. All this stuff's painted? Yeah. It's somebody tried to materialize their wet dream. <clears throat> <laughs> They're wet dream with the green bake light. Though the green AKs now uh, exist only in the, in the uh, um, museums. Okay, so I was just trying to do a Google search, guys. Um, all right, so we don't know is the bottom line for sure, but probably not, right? Most likely not. Yeah, most likely not. All right, last question. So I know Paul's getting fidgety. The here we go. Mustang Perry. What is everyone in, in what in everyone's opinion is the best bayonet? Also, how many different ways can they be mounted? And we've talked about it different ways, but best bayonet. Marco. The new new AK-12, all-around great camp knife, fighting knife. Um, My tongue doesn't want to even even pronounce this, but bayonet, because you know you're not gonna you're not gonna charge any redoubts and stuff uh, against the columns of uh, Napoleonic army. But um, can can we call them bayo knives? They are bayo knives. This called bayo knives. Bayo knives. They bayo all knives. called a stick nosh. Stick means in Russian bayonet. Nosh means knife. Huh. So it's a bayonet knife. That's what they. Damn call. it! I thought I just coined that. Yeah. I'm going to trademark it anyway. Just do it. You seventy years. Paul, too what's late. your favorite? What's your favorite bayo? Oh man, that that is that, that is a, you know, it's kind of like uh, what's your favorite rifle. You know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a, there's a lot of good ones out there. And, you know, the truth of the matter is, is if if I had, let's say, if I was a person who lived in, in a cul-de-sac community in the United States of America, of course, I would have to do this 10 to 15 years ago. And I wanted all my guys to be ready to repel borders when, you know, the zombies come from the city to take all our stuff. I would buy everybody, every single one of them, a Nagant with bayonets. 
<laughs> and I would I would put those guys out at the end of the cul-de-sac because the the the, the homeboys, you know, the, the the creepy crawlies from the city, they'd yeah. be like, I don't I don't think you shoot me, but I I don't know, they might stab me. Um and it and the, the, the truth is thing. You Here's can you, that that rifle is. I mean, when you put a bayonet on it, it's as tall as I am, you know. And it probably was taller than most soldiers it was issued to. So yeah. if you want to keep creepy crawlies at bay, um, and and the, the, you know they're they're blue steel, I would I would spray paint them silver. I would get like chrome. I would get chrome paint shine. and make chrome. them chrome. So they gleam. So the they sun. gleam. Oh yeah, yeah. They look <laughs> so they stand out. So there's no <laughs> question, you, you, dude. People don't want to mess with with sharp steel. They Get don't. Get you a light that uh, flashes you, on you in the flex. Probably because of the length of it and stuff, you can probably throw it like a freaking uh, what's they call them pullums or whatever. <laughs> the, the, Pylum, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, spear. Uh, the yeah. short, short uh, spears and stuff. Rich, um, what's your favorite bayonet? Uh, for myself, it would be the 1993 Full Tang USMC um, uh, M9 that was developed here at Buck in uh, post well in the time in California. But it's just amazing knife. It uh, was just just amazing. I can't say anything else. It's super strong. I'm not surprised. Super okay. thick. Yeah. So mine is the sword bayonet. That's that's what I want. I want the sword bayonet. <laughs> that's cool. Like like this one right here. No, like the the actual sword bayonets back the, in the like the trench. Oh, the ones trench, like uh, the what is it, chauffeur or whatever? The French ones. They had yeah. the little. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. These here, I'll show you. Those. Yeah, that thing. Is. That one. Yeah, that's cool. That's. I forgot favorite. what that uh, hook was for, but it was purposely. Done because it's not just French, but Italians did it. Is it for parrying? It could be like breaking a sword or something, or yeah, like like, like hook, hook the enemy's sword. bayonet, parry it. I think it was I to mean, hook them in a in a jaw and pull them off stage. <laughs> well, it, Marty going medieval on us. That's right. That's right. We we were talking about this polite and civilized stabbing people in the gut i tell you who i want to go stab i want to go and stab some hamases <laughs> all right so of our of our questions there we've got three things to give away we're going to give away a mission first tactical uh big drink drinky drink um probably i don't know if it's going to be this design or what design it'll be but you'll get one of these for one of our listeners and then, of course, seal one, seal one and done for all your gun cleaning and, and lube needs. You'll get a full kit uh, with the seal one. Where do you CLP sit on your bench and next to your nightstand? Where about? Both. <laughs> both. Both. I said, where do you keep that lube? Oh, everywhere, baby. <laughs> on your bench, this stuff. Your work bench. It smells or, uh, good. Next to your nightstand. It's so good, and it's orange, and it doesn't leave an orange stain. So you can put that on your lips. Tap your lips up there. Put a little bit behind your ears. If you're going out on a date, you got you a Tinder date. Hell yeah. Smell good, baby. <laughs> so still one and done. And then, of course, Rich, who just disappeared. I don't know where he went. We're going to give away uh, one of his bayonet books. Books. Yeah, I'm going to give away one of the books there. So there he's back. You yeah. disappeared. Huh? I'm sorry. I had technical difficulty. Yep, I'll, I'll get an autograph book for somebody. All right. So, and yourself. Thank you. What? Uh, let's go through for the book, uh, Rich. Let Rich pick. His favorite was, question. Yeah, what was your favorite question out of those? I, I, I'm so sorry. I had technical difficulty. I didn't hear the questions. <laughs> No, I read all when we just went through all the questions. No, I, I know I had to hang up and get back in, and I missed it when you were doing that. It took me about forty five seconds. The the questions that we just read, all those questions. I missed about our favorite bayonets and stuff like that. You, I, I just heard. That's all I heard was fake. Oh no, the is there a difference between all the AK forty seven? What is everyone's opinion of the best bayonet? Any ideas on why the AK oh. bayonet straight from the spear point design? 
Fun fact, Toy Dreamer has it. All right, pick a number between one and, one and 15. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, 13. <laughs> 13. <laughs> you would pick 13. Huh? Yeah. T. Hayden, 83. At the time of this, this recording and all the questions that we have, and in the order that I've got them on my phone, T. Hayden, 83, is number 13. So T well, Hayden, congratulations. 83, and congratulations. Absolutely. You have won. Hold your book up again there, Rich. Yes, sir. If you don't mind. The M9 Bayonet, The Authorized History by Richard Nyman. Yep. You're going to get that. And it's going to be autographed. We'll get it signed. Yep, by, we'll get it signed. Rich and CJ. Yes, sir. That's an honor. So email me, T Hayden, and let me know what you won, and we'll need your address. All right, so for the uh, Mission First Tactical Drinky Drink, Marco, what was your favorite question? I'm going to go with the, um, although it wasn't the correct um, <laughs> question, but nevertheless the good one, uh, when he, uh, I forgot difference? the gentleman's name, it's very first question, he yeah. said, Ken, are they interchangeable bayonets between AK-47 and uh, AK-74? FPS Murdoch. So FPS, you know the drill. Email me. Let me know what you want. And then for the seal one and done, CLP plus complete gun cleaning and lube uh, and tender date fragrance kit. Paul, pick the, pick the so, one. So uh, was it Murdoch who asked the thing about uh, does the – does fixing the bayonet affect the bullet, affect the shooting of the rifle? No, that was... It was uh, a different person. B. Hurst, 87. Any problems with shooting with a bayo on? Yeah, yeah. That, that I, I think that's, that's a valid question. And okay. It's something that a lot of people don't, they don't think about. Yeah, very good. So B. Hurst, I think my question was the best when I was asking about the metal and the tanks, but... Oh. Oh, well. You're not eligible. Oh, I, I was going to – you get the water bottle. I get the water bottle? <laughs> Luckily, I got it. So, hey. <laughs> all right. Uh, all you winners, email me. Let me know what you won and your addresses, and we'll get you the prize. And Marco's got a new hat. West Coast Foam and what? And fiber. And fiber. Foam and fiber. We don't shoot blanks. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you get all these trucker hats at? Are you stopping at? I also have like Quickies, you know, one hour photo in the Redondo Beach. Buckies? Y'all been to a Buckies? Quickies. Quickies. Is that what it's called? Quickies? You know, it's in the window. You know, then I got the waxer, you know, the board shop. Yeah, I saw, I've seen, <laughs> you've held that one up. It's a Hollister uh, company that they have these things. Yeah. So you've got a Bravo Company hat you're wearing today, sporting the Bravo Company. I've got my Factory yeah. 47 uh, black multicam logoed hat on. If you guys want to get the AK, and I got my Factory 47 AK t-shirt. If you want to get our AK Corner logoed, and Marco's got the uh, Factory 47 Calumet High Wolverines Class of 84 shirt, classic. <laughs> You can get any of these items and more at Factory 47. Go to Factory 47 with a K, F-A-K-T-O-R-Y 47.com. Use the code LEADHEAD to get 10% off. Uh, and then if you want to, uh, you didn't win the SEAL 1, you want to get the SEAL 1, go to SEAL1.com, use the code LEADHEAD, get 25% off. And they've got a really nice uh, rod cleaning system that they uh, just put out this year. Um, one of the best that I've cleaning seen. rod system, cleaning rod system, yeah. Not a rod. Not cleaning any system. kind of other rod. <laughs> cleaning rod system, rod cleaning system. A cleaning rod system. Not However, a rod you want to system. use it is up to you, Paul. But <laughs> <laughs> so, it's interchangeable. I have a funny story about this shirt, though. Wait a minute. Let where? me get the code. Go uh, leadhead twenty five percent off sale one dot com. Go ahead. I have a funny story about this T-shirt, right? Yeah. Obviously, it's a reference to Red Dunn, right? Yeah, the Calumet High. Right. So the guy, I'm checking out, and he's the cashier, and he, he looks like my age. He's looking at it, and he goes, it's cool that they're still doing this. 
And I'm like, uh, doing what? He says, well, you, you went to your class reunion, right? <laughs> And I was like, you know, it's like fake, right? It's it's a Hollywood, it's, you know, it's a movie reference. Yeah, only cool people so, get the oh, reference. So, I thought you went to Columbus High School, which we have one apparently in Michigan, in Western. Ah. Michigan. <laughs> How you met? And, 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 and because I'm in Ann Arbor, the Wolverines is, you know, yeah, yeah, natural. Oh yeah. There you go. See, Wolverines. There you go. So uh, for our listeners, I'm holding up. It's the an ill-tempered badger. Short run uh, U.S. Palm mags that we did um, with the the graffiti um, Red Dawn Wolverine. We did an actual Calumet High like he's got on his shirt magazine, and then we did an AK corner. We're gonna do another run of some some court some sort of cool design. We're not gonna do those designs, but we'll do some new ones. So. Stay tuned. You know, you know what you should do? Tell me. Company 9. Or Com- ninth Company design. Remember that movie? Ninth. Did you see that movie? The Boys from Company 9. Uh, no. Which no? one's that? That's, um, Is that that insect it's movie? It's sort of like a, similar to We Were Soldiers, right? When they uh, mm. sitting there on the top of the hill. It's in Afghanistan during the Soviet War, uh, the Afghan War. And they were in charge of, uh, there was a company, it actually was like a platoon size, size detachment. It was not even the 20 people. Yeah. Up on the hill and they over overseeing this uh, um, highway that they're supposed to provide security for. And then being attacked by over 300 Mujahideens. Ah. And, then, and it's kind of like the lost man standing type of deal. Okay. Oh, you should watch that movie. It's, it's on Netflix. Even on YouTube, it's all What's it called again? Ninth Company. Ninth Company. Okay. I'll watch that tonight because I got nothing else to do tonight. So, um, Leadheads, shoot me your ideas on the next run of mags, what you want, what you'd like to have on the AK mags that we do next. Um, the most the most votes will, is probably what we're going to do. Uh, and then, of course, Mission First Tactical. Go to Mission First Tactical. Use the code Leadhead. Get 20% off. Any of their products that they've got there, their drinky drinks, their holsters, their AR uh, accessories and furniture that they have. And they've got some cool T-shirts and and swag and stuff there, too. So uh, go show them the love. Let them know how much you appreciate uh, sponsoring our show. I'll spit it out in a minute. <laughs> All right, I got I got grandbabies inbound. I want to see. I love you guys. I want to see them. But Where you're not as they? cool as my grandbabies. Bring, bring <laughs> Ruthie oh. to me. It's always nice to see Stay you. Stay safe, man. Good, Stay good safe. to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank give, you. Give Ruthie nice a kiss for me, Paul. I'll, I will. About M nine and you can actually Facetime me if you want to with her. Thank you. <laughs> so. Thank all you, right, Marco. Marco, thank you so much. I appreciate uh, all your knowledge again. You were, uh, again, surprisingly overly knowledgeable about <laughs> about all this stuff. You know, if I could, like, do the data dump and then, like, uh, reboot my system, because a friend of mine said he was, like, pondering. He was sitting there and pondering, and he goes, you know what? I realize how much useless shit I actually know. <laughs> I don't think this is useless just, though. It's very, it's very entertaining and it's interesting. Yeah. It's intriguing, the stuff that you well, know about. Well, I'm glad I could oblige, but um, uh, you like I said, <laughs> so much crap I know. Yeah, and it's sort of like a, you know, it's not, it's not. Uh, um, I mean, bayonets. It's not enough to write a book so to speak so that doesn't make me I don't know. rich rich wrote a book on I, it. <laughs> hey listen I, I disagree with all the knowledge you have on the russian uh, bayonets you sh- definitely should well it'd just be cool just uh, historical wise you know bayonets in general not just the the russian ones. yeah yeah so yeah. Um, i mean when i first started collecting right and i kind of went from like the modern stuff and well first i went with the stuff that was issued to me I just wanted to have my kit, everything from uniforms to shoes, everything, and uh, and then it went on to went on to like a modern stuff. Like I started getting into ARs and you know all these modern long range rifles and things like this. But it was always my uh, and then I kind of went into historic thing. 
because you know my my family has been affected by World War II like you would not believe. I mean, uh, twelve members of my family, including both of my fathers, their brothers, all went to war, and only one of them came back. Out of twelve people, only one came back, like which was like a cousin. So I figured it was a, such a big deal, so I started doing the World War II. But you can't do World War II without American guns, right? Like a M1 Garand, M1 Carbine, even 1903, yeah. A3, for example. And then if you do that, then you got to do the British, <laughs> right? Yeah, and Australian and, as, and as everybody As much as else. I freaking hated Nazi shit, you cannot have a, a appreciation of a firearms fully without the uh, K-98 or Mauser, per se. Yeah. So, and my, my thing was always... You know, once you get the firearm, you got to get everything else to go with it. The sling, the freaking, uh, the ammo pouches, the bayonet, and it's so on and so It's a black hole. It never ends. I know it. And <laughs> yeah. I was telling you, I mean, like, last time you and I talked, and I don't consider myself a knife guy. But yes, if I had are. to guess how many knives I have, like, guess, like, uh, in my carrying it in the pockets and somewhere in the pouches and stuff... If I say 200, it probably wouldn't be far off. Yeah. But I don't particularly buy them, per se. Like, I, I buy certain things for collection, but I have, like, a, a strange number of freaking Scandinavian knives because my father always told me, look, the best knife is Sami knife or Lop knife or, you, you know, like right. one of those Pukos and uh, Lapin Lyokus and things like that. So I have a good number of them. Then... As a proxy, you wind up with all kinds of Mora knives and, and then all kinds of folders and this and this. And my my son, my older son, he is not helping. He keeps giving <laughs> me this. He's not like, helping. <laughs> right. He keeps giving me this like special edition of uh, uh, bench maids for some reason lately. Well, the, the, the little sh you know, scabbard that made out of shark skin. Well, probably because you said one time you liked one and then... That's no, no, takes. no, uh-uh. Yeah. But I always kind of like a, I kind of gave them knives when I had extras and stuff. I'll just always, they always bought my son's book. Well, you know, I'm knives. doing a, a knife segment now. So we'll get you on and we'll do a knife. We'll get you on for the knife segment. Yeah, I have some and weird gonna, ones. Like, yeah. some, not weird, but let's say uncommon knives. Yeah, you showed me some of them uh, a couple of months back. So I was very yeah, like a yakut those. knife with that doll, one uh -huh. big doll on one side, but it's sharp as a bastard. Yeah, and it's like you start bleeding by just looking at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Again, and the intimidation the same factor. Thing, <clears throat> same thing with bayonets and stuff. And here, let me do this. Let me, let me sign really off, and we'll it. talk about this. So let me do the end of the show. Right. So, Rich, thank you for taking the time thank to be you, on. Sir. Really appreciate you bringing the the knowledge of the M9 and. Um, being generous with our listeners with with the gift there too. So thank you so much, and I'm looking thank, forward to having you, you and Commander on where we're going to talk about the uh, the new Buckmaster 2.0, the diver combat diver knife. Where did mine go? Here it is. Can I ask a All question? Right. Go ahead. Uh, the the knife on that on that um, front page right there. It's got those two spikes on yeah. it. What what are those? That's an anchoring system. Uh you, you can now, reverse them too, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it's an actual anchoring system. You tie a line to it, and you can actually anchor on the uh lefty showing the new one. The new one has an uh, anchor wing that goes through the middle and it holds uh it holds uh four hundred plus pounds and these only held two fifty. The idea was to just lock gear down so the seals were good at going in. And when they came back, sometimes their ways to get out wasn't there. So what they did is they uh, sometimes hooked boats up and different things and submerged it and used it as an anchor and used that to hook onto coral. Oh, so that was, yeah, that was just a, a little little tool. But but this knife led to the M9 bayonet. And see the handle? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the round yeah. handle we talked about. Yeah, yeah. I have to say, Richard, after talking to you and uh, listening to what you have to say, I have better appreciation of uh, M9. Oh, Marco, I'll get you one of my books, too. Oh, great. Thanks, man. I, I, I started off at a, a church camp 
uh, an Orthodox church camp. My father was a Russian Orthodox priest for 55 years. Get so, out. No, really? Yeah. Wow. Wow. So, what, a, what a small world. Yes, Are you still a church goer? Or? Absolutely. Yep. Wow. Yeah, we have we have a nice little church here called St. Vladimir's. Nice. Here in Ann Arbor. And the the uh, not the the current um, priest, but uh, one before him was a hockey player from Michigan, <laughs> University of Michigan. Oh, that's, that's cool. Awesome. <laughs> so, Marco, Good what's show. the uh, what's next month's AK Corner? All right. So, what have we covered? We covered. Um, all right. Let's do a machine guns. How's that? Like a not necessarily uh, select fire guns, but the, like the machine guns, the, the light machine guns. Like RPKs and uh, PKMs and that kind of stuff. Okay, we'll do that. That sounds good. I like that. And then December, we're going to do the AK versus AR episode. I, I don't know if I will survive that long and, and probably. Till December? <laughs> You'll be just fine. <laughs> but, it's uh, a fun episode. We have a good time on that. So until then, till next month, Leadheads, be boning up on your light machine guns. And uh, send in your uh, your topic suggestions for next year because it's getting time for next year. So until then, All right. we're out. All right, out here. Thank you. Super.